All right, we're rolling. My name is Jane Guberman. Today is Thursday, December 15th, 2016. I'm here with David Schneer at his home in Rockville, Maryland, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. David, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes, you do. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your involvement with Fabrengen and the impact that the Chavaraz had on your own life and on the larger Jewish world. And I'd like to begin by talking about your personal and family background a little bit and to flesh out who you were at the time you first got involved with Fabrengen. Can you tell me to start very briefly about your family when you were growing up? You were born in 1948 in Brooklyn, right? Right. Okay, right. so tell me about your father and your mother and your family. Um, both my parents were also born in Brooklyn. Uh, they um, were married in Brooklyn and left uh, New York uh, to start a poultry farm in New Jersey. Um, my father had been um, working in the poultry business uh, before then and wanted to have his own uh, place. And my mother was looking for uh, a way to get out of Brooklyn. and. Um, so they uh, settled uh, just outside of Lakewood, uh, New Jersey, in Jackson Township, on uh, an 11-acre uh, poultry farm, and that's where I spent the first 12 years uh, of my life. Hmm. Um, tell me about your father, whom you, you said was a communist, is that right, or his family? My background? father uh, wouldn't, he wasn't a communist. Um, um, his parents were communists. My grandfather actually uh, had gone to yeshiva in uh, in the Ukraine, uh, in a city called Dnipetrovsk, and um, but then he was attracted to um, the revolution, and uh, and uh, got involved and and as well as my grandmother, um, uh, they came to this country. Um, by the time they came to this country, they they were card carrying communists, and. Um, uh, uh, and that's how my father grew up in that, in that household, uh, he and his brother. Uh, my uncle, um, Oliver Shalom, he, uh, he continued his communist affiliations for a long time um, and was very much the activist in the, in the family. Uh, my father um, was more of, a, uh, more of a capitalist, you know, but an enlightened capitalist. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the bad. Uh, family story you know, on that side. What about your mother's, on your mother's side? Uh, my mother's side, they were also, uh, she was born in Brooklyn, and my grandparents from, uh, from Poland. Um, Shemeshel is the name of the town. And, uh, What's the name? Shemeshel. Um, it was the provincial capital uh, there in south, uh, uh, southeastern Poland. And uh, they um, came here in the early 1900s. Uh, they were affiliated or associated with uh, the Arbiter Ring, with, uh, with the Workmen's Circle, and um, uh, they were also workers, uh, I mean, they were involved in union, union uh, organizing, my, my grandfather more than my grandmother. Uh, she was more involved in, in raising the kids, they had three daughters, uh, and uh, so that's a little bit about that background, yeah. So your, your family yeah. moved to the Lakewood, New Jersey area, which mm -hmm. had been a home to Jewish chicken farmers starting, I think, in about the 1920s That's right. or yeah. so. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what year was it, approximately, when your parents moved there? Uh, they moved there in 1947, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was born in 48, so they were already established there. And my mother wanted to give birth to me in Brooklyn because um, she didn't trust the hospital in the, in the sticks, as she called it. And um, so I was born in Brooklyn, lived in Brooklyn for a few weeks, and then came back to the farm. And <laughs> yeah. What was the Jewish community in Lakewood like when you were growing up? Uh, the Jewish community in Lakewood. Um, well, it was a center for the poultry farming industry. It was also a resort uh, town. There were numerous hotels, and there were horses and buggies in the streets, and folks coming in from New York, in the, in the, mainly in the winter. Uh, during the summer, they would go, I guess, folks would go more to the Borscht Belt. But in the winter, because of the pines, that we had this, uh, pine trees were just all over. It was, it's the pine region of, of New Jersey. 
and uh, people would come for the fresh air and for the, these lovely hotels. Um, uh, it was also a center, um, the beginning of a center for the uh, yeshiva called, um, uh, okay, I'm, now I'm blocking the name, Abes Pindrish Gavoha, which was transplanted from, uh, from Europe, uh, just uh, as I understand, just after the Holocaust. And uh, when we moved into Lakewood, uh, uh, when I was 12, uh, we lived around the corner from the Beit Medrash or Beis Medrash Gavoha, I should say, and uh, had, not, had an opportunity to uh, meet some, uh, some folks associated with uh, the yeshiva and, and actually took a, did a, studied in a shiur there when I was in high school. Uh, my folks, uh, the Jewish community was primarily an Orthodox, uh, a, a couple of Orthodox congregations and a Reformed temple. Um, and there and and uh, neither of those institutions uh, appealed to my uh, my parents. My father really didn't care so much about you know uh, you know how uh, religion took hold in the family. He really left that up to my mother. She had much stronger feelings about that. But um, but they weren't comfortable with the Orthodox or the Reform uh, options, and they started. Uh, along with a few other families, a conservative synagogue in, in Lakewood. They founded uh, Ahavat Shalom, uh, uh, which was um, uh, recently, actually, with the, the past few years, it, it now is an Orthodox, uh, part of the Orthodox community. So they started that, and, uh, and that's where I got my primary uh, Jewish education, and, um, and uh, the rabbi there became very close with uh, my family. He encouraged me to go to Camp Ramah, and I went to Camp Ramah for three summers in the 60s. Um, but the Jewish community, I, I, I don't know the exact numbers, it was a relatively small Jewish community. The town itself, I think, numbered maybe 11,000 in the 60s, as I recall. And, uh, uh, but it was a very close-knit uh, Jewish community. The, um, those who founded the congregation uh, were very close uh, to each other. Mm -hmm. and, and the excitement of, of starting a community, uh, you know, is very vivid in my in my memory, um, and uh, you know, and and, and you know, I, and I think because my my mother especially, but also my father, they were both on the board of directors, and they both were in the choir. My parents uh, both uh, in love with uh, singing and music. Uh, my father was kind of strange because he didn't have a Jewish uh, kind of a serious Jewish education. They both spoke Yiddish, but um, but because he was also a trained uh, singer, um, sang you know for a while in the choir and uh, and really enjoyed that part of it. Was there a lot of singing in your family life, sort of around like sh or Shabbat, Shab you know, holidays, Shabbos? Uh, not so much in the immediate family. Um, as we grew into the congregation and became um, more familiar with. Um, I guess melodies, especially on Pesach, uh, we sang a lot of the melodies that were created by the uh, the Malavsky family choir. Um, the the, the Malavsky, this famous uh, family, um, Samuel Malavsky was a, a cantor, uh, born in Europe, and um, he started a family choir. His, I, if I recall, um, he had four daughters and one son. And uh, all wonderful singers, or maybe three daughters and one son, um, but they weren't. They were Orthodox, and of course, because of Kol Isha, they weren't allowed to sing in the synagogues. They couldn't perform in Orthodox settings. So he created his own independent uh, family choir, and they traveled all over the world. They were on cruise ships. They, they sang in the Borscht Belt. They went to Israel, and um, and Goldie Malowski, uh, the um, I guess the more prominent singer in the choir, female voice. Uh, she was our choir director and, uh, and taught me uh, music. And her husband, uh, Menachem uh, Goldman, was also a, a teacher of mine and just a wonderful singer. And I learned so much music from, from him personally as a kid. Did you sing uh, in the choir when you were a kid? Uh, no, we had a children's choir. And I actually still sing or uh, teach some of the melodies that we learned to uh, our community, our Chavara community here in, uh, in Bethesda. Uh, so, you know, it had a major impact on me, the, his, uh, their teachings, his teaching, and, um, and the family. My, uh, we didn't do a lot of singing at home. My father often sang uh, in, the, in the truck when we were delivering 
uh, either eggs or, or baby chicks to, uh, to, to folks in what New Jersey. I, uh, oh, so Lomio, he was more of the Italian kind of, uh, you know, uh, he didn't sing anything and really in Yiddish. My mother was much more, um, she played piano as well. And uh, so we have, and I still have her books of Yiddish, uh, of Yiddish music. Um, so, so was there Yiddish being spoken in your home when you were a child? Yes, uh, it was uh, the language at the table um, between my parents and partly because um, uh, they didn't want us as was pretty common, us, us being my sisters and myself, to know what they were saying. Did uh, you? Uh, no, until I, I started uh, uh, on the side getting some lessons from my grandmother. Um, you know, she... Uh, Sounds subversive. Yeah, so yeah, it was a little bit subversive. I. I I picked up some uh, some the, some Yiddish through her, and then also studied Yiddish later on on my own. But uh, uh, yeah, it was it was pretty common. My father went to uh, visit with the other poultry farmers. Uh, he often spoke Yiddish with them because many of them were uh, immigrants um, who came here before the Holocaust, and uh, so he, you know, spoke with them in Yiddish. I remember hearing the language a uh, fair amount, actually. Yeah. Tell us about your Jewish education, both formal and informal, uh, when you were growing up. Um, formal and informal. So Start with formal. Uh, formal. Uh, well, I went to this Orthodox uh, nursery school, which is a terrible, terrible experience, as it turned out. Um, yeah, the, one, one quick story, uh, and uh, it, it, the teacher was talking about God, and, and, uh, so I, and I asked, I said, where's God? You know? And she said, well, she's got, she said, God's in the... You know, in the shul, you know, behind the ark, you know. I said, okay. So one day we went to the cafeteria for uh, for snack, you know, and um, and and we were on our way back, and of course we had to make a straight line and be quiet. Well, I uh, went to the end of the uh, the line uh, with uh, standing with another kid, and I said, let's go into the shul to find God. So he and I went into the shul uh, to find God. So, and I walked up on the bima, and it was pretty dark in the room. And um, I uh, went to the curtains, the, uh, the Aron HaKodesh, and, uh, and I called out, God, are you there? And um, there was no um, response. And um, so here I said, uh, I asked again, God, are you there? And there's no response. So I, I reached up, uh, I couldn't reach the string. Uh, to pull the curtain open, and so I, um, but I could move it with my hand, so I, uh, I opened uh, part of the curtain, and I stuck my head in there, <laughs> said, God, where are you? And there was no answer, and I was, I was really upset, you know, I, was, I said, God, the teacher didn't tell me the truth, you know, so, so I went back to class, I got back to class, and she started yelling at us, you know, where, you, where were you? What are you doing? I says, well, I was looking for God. And she's yelling at us. You know, I started crying. I was a very sensitive kid, you know. Um, and cry, I started crying, and uh, my mother came to me, and I said, I'm not going back. And I threw, I threw a tantrum. And that was my last day, you know, in uh, nursery school at um, this Orthodox mm. congregation. Um, the next experience was uh, my parents then uh, sent me to uh, in Freehold, New Jersey, which was not that far from our farm. Our farm was like sort of between Freehold and Lakewood, and uh, she sent me to another to an Orthodox Hebrew school there, where I uh, learned uh, was you know regular learning Hebrew and whatever else. And the teacher there started uh, uh, teaching us Hebrew, and she uh, the, her method of teaching was read until you make a mistake. And I would almost always make a mistake on the first or second syllable or first or second word, you know. And there were some kids that would just read for like five, ten minutes, you know. And this was a class of about 20 kids, so I never had a chance to even read. And it was super frustrating, you know. So after about... And also they made me wear the tzitzis, you know, which was all getting tangled up, you know, especially in the bathroom. It's just really a very uncomfortable experience. And, um, and one day I just threw another time and said, I'm not going back. Forget it. And uh, so I was taken out of, out of that uh, Hebrew school experience. So I didn't have a very positive Hebrew school experience or Jewish educational experience, you might say. And uh, at that point, um, 
Uh, my mother, who's an, herself an uh, organizer and uh, very, uh, just, just very uh, capable uh, woman, and um, she decided, okay, let's try and do something about, about this. And she met other people in Lakewood who also were looking for an alternative, and they created the synagogue. And, uh, and my mother was convinced that they were going to find teachers that would work well with the students, and that's what they did. They found wonderful teachers. Uh, Menachem Goldman, I mentioned, who um, was a uh, resistance fighter in the Holocaust. Another teacher was a Holocaust survivor. Um, wonderful, wonderful teachers. And, um, and I had uh, just, for me, a totally positive experience you know, in Hebrew school after that. Yeah. You mentioned that's 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 the early formal, and then I went on to uh, I was also part of a rabbi, the rabbi's study group. It was an LTF, which means leadership training fellowship group, um, a special for a few of us. There were maybe four four of us or five of us in the uh, in uh, we were teenagers at the time who uh, had additional studies with the rabbi, and occasionally we'd go to New York to the Jewish Theological Seminary and have a special uh, session with uh, Chaim Potok. Okay. I didn't know who he was at the time, <laughs> you know, so he was very nice, that's all I, that's all I know. And uh, uh, so I had those kinds of experiences, and of course went to Camp Ramah, and those summers we had studied formally in classes in the morning, and I, I didn't mind, I kind of liked it. I loved, loved the environment of Ramah and the what service. Did you, what did you love about Ramah? I, uh, the sense of community, uh, the sense of uh, this, the singing was fantabulous. Uh, the outdoor services around the Eitz Chaim, the, the tree, the, the lake, being in nature, you know, it, it was like going back to the farm for me in a way, and, uh, um, you know, the, the friendships and, and being of, um, in community, being in community. And, uh, and, and that had, um, you know, in, in, I think that, that experience, Ramah, really... Um, you know, kind of set me on a certain path, you know, in, my, in the work that I've done in creating communities that have tried to mirror, you know, the experience that I had at Camp Ramah. So I thank the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, for that experience. Uh, other formal, I decided uh, actually to go into the joint program uh, at the seminary and Columbia University uh, when I graduated high school, um, but partly because of financial issues and, and also the idea of being in a city and not uh, closer to the country, you know, kind of didn't feel right. So I decided to go to uh, Rutgers, a lot less expensive. Uh, and I, uh, I uh, started out majoring in sociology, but then, uh, then gravitated more to, uh, uh, to Hebraic or Judaic studies there. So I graduated with a degree in Judaic studies from Rutgers. How would you characterize your experience with Rutgers Hillel? You were involved with Hillel, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, it started out uh, fine. Um, that's where I ate. I was, we were, I was part of the kosher, uh, kosher uh, eating eatery there. So this uh, was you were at Rutgers starting in 1966. 66, right. To 70. To 70. That's right. Okay. Um, yeah, and this is in New Brunswick, uh, New Jersey. Uh, yeah, it was a good experience. Uh, the rabbi there was very, very nice um, and uh, very open and. Um, I got involved, you know, in the programming at, at, at Hillel um, pretty quickly. Um, I, I organized creative services. That was one of the things that I, I enjoyed doing, uh, contemporizing, you know, uh, services um, on Friday nights or Saturday mornings. I forget exactly when. Contemporizing in what way? Uh, incorporating um, uh, uh, poetry. Um, special readings, quotes, uh, music. Uh, Je Jewish or not necessarily Jewish? Uh, in all of those. Jewish and non-Jewish. Yeah. Um, I don't know where that idea came from, actually, but uh, but it, it was I had this desire just to contemporize, you know, the 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 worship or the davening experience. Um, so that felt good. I became a Hillel officer uh, as well, and then. Uh, but I became increasingly aware of the world around me. Um, and that time we're talking about uh, the Vietnam War was, was going very strong. Uh, in fact, I was actually in ROTC for a brief time. 
I don't know if I wrote about that uh, previously, no. uh, uh, for a pretty brief time. I, I was convinced to, to join ROTC by the president of Hillel, who was in ROTC, he was two years ahead of me. And he thought it'd be a really good thing because there's this war and uh, you'll go in as a, uh, you know, as an officer, you know, and there are benefits. And, and uh, so I, I, didn't, I didn't know from anything, you know, 1966. So I, I did that. And then uh, one day while marching down College Avenue, um, someone who I knew from, uh, from USY, from uh, United Synagogue Youth in Northern New Jersey, um, he calls out my name. He says, Schneer, what are you doing? What are you doing there? And he was like out there, you know, kind of throwing flowers at us, okay, with a bunch of other people, okay? Uh, and uh, this person's name uh, is uh, Daniel Siegel, all right? So he says, we got to get together. <laughs> so we got together and uh, afterwards, and he, um, he basically, you know, informed me of certain things I wasn't, uh, didn't really know about. Some of them were the, the politics of the Vietnam War. And, um, and I began thinking and I began looking more into what, you know, what I was doing and becoming uh, feeling dis disconnected from that whole experience in ROTC. And I, I wound up uh, actually flunking out of ROTC because I, I stopped polishing the brass and I, and I did miserably on the, on the exams. And, so, uh, and I, I racked up so many demerits that there was no way I could advance in ROTC. And even though the colonel on campus tried to uh, convince me to stay and, and to help me, and I, uh, I bowed out. Uh, of RTC, and I, uh, and the following year, I um, then uh, uh, moved in. Uh, where was it? The following year? No, no, it was a couple of years later. I became close with uh, some of the folks in SDS, and um, so my my whole world, you know, kind of view uh, um, changed and became much larger. And um, did and you that, begin getting involved in protests? Uh, yeah, somewhat, somewhat. But this brings us back to Hillel, because Hillel um, was not involved at all. Uh, the Hillel uh, program had nothing to do what was what was going on in the larger society, you know. And uh, meanwhile, so many other folks on campus were getting more engaged in, you know, in in, in responding to the war, uh, and so I. Um, you know, I felt that need, and I and I saw that in the Jewish community at large. I mean, there was very little, you know, engagement, and in, in you know, in any of the uh, movements, women's liberation. I mean, very civil nothing. Rights. Civil rights. Civil, civil rights, rights. Women's liberation. I, I mean, no, virtually no involvement, no connection, and this uh, began to weigh on me. So I, uh, along with one of the other members of the kosher kitchen, kosher kitchen, kosher eatery at Hillel who was formerly an Orthodox Jew, who uh, was one of the, uh, but uh, kept kosher, but was also a member of SDS. So he, <laughs> he and I, and uh, another two people, um, started a Jewish Religious Fellowship for Action, okay, on campus. And we started organizing uh, other Jewish students and faculty that, you know, uh, we thought would be simpatico, and, we, um, we organized this group. And there was a, a, a real estate person in town who heard about us and liked what we stood for. He was also apparently anti-war. And um, he said, listen, do you need a place to, to meet? And of course we said yes, and he gave us the loft of, um, of a building that he owned that wasn't being used in, in, uh, in New Brunswick next to the railroad station. And we moved, in, we moved into this loft and uh, which was <laughs> larger than the Hillel, actually. And we started meeting there and having dinners there and, uh, and organizing and, and having classes there. We met with local rabbis studying um, about social justice, also studying about Jewish spirituality, and, and, and also meeting with people who could inform us about what was going on politically. How large a group were you when, you, when this was getting underway? Um, we... Uh, um, it's hard to say. We might have had maybe meeting the, maybe the most number of people that we had at this uh, in this loft was maybe some fifty, 
But we, when we organized the, uh, we organized a Yisker memorial service for, a Viet, for the Vietnam dead, actually, mm-hmm. on campus. And more than 200 people came out for this Yisker memorial service. And this was 1969 that we did this. Um, we also participated in, in different marches. And, uh, we, did you have any relationship with Hillel? Or what was Hillel? Uh, very little. To all At that point, I, I, at one point I was living with two Hillel officers. When I dropped out of Hillel, I, had, I was living with the president and the vice president of Hillel. I mean, so it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was okay, but it was a little awkward. And um, so we had this, I wouldn't call it a competing organization, but we had our purpose our, our, was very different. And, uh, and, and, then we, um, and then after a year we changed our name to the New Brunswick Chavura. Okay? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was going to ask you, I understand that you'd been the national president of Atid right. and had met people from other That's right. schools and communities. Can, did that have an impact on sort of your vision of what you were trying to create at all? Uh, yeah, uh, Atid, yeah. Um, in Atid, I met uh, a lot of folks who um, also were interested in uh, growing, uh, growing in their consciousness about um, the changes that we needed, not only in the, in the society as a whole, and, but also in the Jewish community. Um, and who did I meet in Atid? I met folks like Art Green, because he was one of our teachers at our uh, conferences that we, that we had. Um, Can you say what Atid, Atid was? Atid, first of all, the word Atid means future, and it was the college age organization of the United Synagogue of America. The high school group was called United Synagogue Youth, um, and, um, and they, they created it at some point. Uh, Michael Lerner, by the way, was um, the, one of the first presidents. Michael Lerner was the president of Atid. Uh, two years after he was president, uh, Daniel Siegel was president of Atid, and then two years later after that, I was president of Atid. So it's kind of an interesting lineage of those of us who, um, who, uh, who found grounding, I think, in this organization. We, we, it helped us discover who we were in relationship to the Jewish community and the rest of society, I think, it was very helpful. Uh, the year I was president, uh, we had our national convention in Chicago, and uh, the theme for that convention was, um, and that was 1968, right after the riots in the uh, 68 riots, and I think it was Columbia and also Chicago, the Democratic National Convention. So assassinations we, also. Assassinations. It was an intense year, right? So our uh, theme for that year was a quote from the was a takeoff from a teaching in the Talmud. The teaching in the Talmud is uh, was the Dina de Machuta uh, the law of the land is the law, okay? as a way of saying to the Jewish population, this is, you know, when you're living in a country, you have to follow the laws of the country. So the, uh, our theme that year was, um, the, law, uh, the law of the land is the law, question mark. You see? And we explored, you know, um, dissent, and the, what, what that means, what that meant in our tradition. Um, and uh, anyway, so that, so... So we were engaged. Um, the vi- my vice president at the time um, was uh, Mark no- um, Novak. Um, Bill. Bill. I know another person named Mark. Mark Novak is a musician and also a renewal rabbi <laughs> here in town. So, uh, so Bill Novak was our vice president. And at the time, um, he had just, I think, taken over as editor Response Magazine. Yeah. OK. So, there, so these folks were all part of the same uh, Connection and and at the same time, 1968, 69, the Chavrat Shalom was emerging. Uh, I I had taken a class with Art Green actually at the seminary in New York in 1967. I think it was 67 during the summer. I was also on staff alternate summers at Camp Ramah in Glens Bay, New York, um, and uh, so I took a class with him, and then he went on to Boston and. Uh, I, I, I knew Peter Geffen from, uh, from National USY. He was the director of the National USY camp, which shared the same camp with Ramah in Glens Bay. Okay, we were on one side, Ramah was on one side of the camp, and uh, Peter Geffen heading up uh, the National USY camp was on the other side. So there are these connections. Uh, uh, 
who else? I, I haven't thought of some of these people's names in a long time. I knew John Ruske from, from those years and, uh, and other people. Um, so you were hearing about the oh, it's hearing about, of Chavarat Shalom, oh, Chavarat 69. Yeah, I was hearing about what was, uh, what was, go, what was going on. Um, and, uh, yeah, clearly, I mean, it was all kind of, and not just within the Jewish world, but also within the general society. You know, the different collectives that were being created. You know, young people were taking, taking charge. You know, we were creating our own institutions in the Jewish world and in the non-Jewish world. And all of this had an impact on, on me personally, of course. You're yeah. also involved in the, the uh, protest at the GA in 69. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah I went, went up there where um, Hillel Levine spoke. Uh, he also was a... Uh, a speaker at a number of the Atid uh, conferences that we had, conventions uh, and summer programs. We also had summer encampments. Um, yeah, so I, uh, yeah, we, uh, we went up there. A number of us from our, our Chavara, from the New Brunswick Chavara, went up to there. And then uh, we also, <laughs> right after that, we, we went to Washington, D.C., where we participated, you know, in the march on Washington. Washington. Yeah. When did the name change? When was the name of the Jewish Religious, Jewish Religious Fellowship for Action changed to New Brunswick Havra? And, and why? Uh, part of the change was we wanted to to reflect something a little larger than ourselves, that um, because our uh, the students involved were both from Rutgers and Douglas, so it it, it wasn't just the Rutgers or the Religious Fellowship. Relig Jewish Religious Fellowship of, you know, what are we talking about? So we, so there was that. The word Chavura resonated with us because we had become very close and it was a member-directed fellowship community. I mean, the word fellowship, it's the same word, Chavura. We wanted to use uh, the, the word Chavura. And I think that the awareness that there was at least that time one or two other Chavurot, you know, in the country might have... It might have felt right to us that we were somehow connected to other chavura, but our particular chavura, um, as I recall, is much more political than the other chavura. We were closer to Naaseh in Philadelphia in terms of the political. We were like in between. What was Naaseh? Uh, Naaseh is a political action fellowship, I guess, started by Daniel Siegel in Philadelphia about during the, the same period. During the same period, yeah. Um, would they call? It would they have called themselves a chavara? I don't know. But we felt comfortable with the word chavara because we, we had Friday night dinners together and uh, we studied. But we were much more engaged in what was happening in the society politically. So, um, Are there any membership criteria for being part of the New Brunswick chavara? Uh, no. Uh, Anybody who wanted to. Anyone who wanted to. Yeah, you know, we. Anyone who wanted to. We never actually. We never incorporated ourselves or anything like that. Um, we didn't seem to have to worry about money. We had a building. People would chip in. So there was no formal organization like we never applied for a five hundred one c three. Yeah. Um, had no, li <coughs> no liability insurance either, if anything. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Was the Chavara engaged in, in sort of training people for activism, would you say? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we did, we, one of our goals uh, was to create peace groups in Raritan Valley. So. What's the name of the valley? Uh, Raritan. Uh, Raritan Valley. Um, <clears throat> and there were... There are a number of synagogues, you know, in Raritan Valley. In, but this is uh, where Highland Rutgers Park. was... Rutgers is based in Ra Raritan Valley, uh, Rutgers Douglas. And uh, Highland Park, uh, Edison, Woodbridge, uh, numerous communities. And uh, so we uh, basically organized, uh, organized ourselves to go into the synagogues and temples uh, asking for a podium to talk about um, the Vietnam War and to talk about... Um, you know, uh, the, how would we say, the, uh, why, why we as Jews must, must take a stand against this 
uh, war. And so we studied um, and uh, we uh, developed a strategy for organizing, which essentially was uh, we would ask the rabbi, you know, if we could speak briefly from the bima about who we were as the, I guess it was the Jewish Religious Fellowship for Action at that particular moment in our, in our, in our history. And, um, and then afterwards we had other members of our group meeting with people after, you know, after services at the Onik Shabbat um, and trying to find people who were symp sympathetic you know, with the cause and to ask them if they would host a meeting a coffee house or something at their home, okay? And that's how we got, we got people to do that. We ultimately created um, 18 peace groups in Raritan App Valley uh, using that strategy of organizing. And what did uh, the peace groups do? What were their activities? What they do? Uh, that was left up to them after they got going. I, I, I don't think we kept track of what they were doing. I know that they... These, uh, they probably kept just were much more aware of the other opportunities for, for getting together for, you know, uh, that, I, that I don't know what yeah. they did yeah, yeah. after that. Uh, yeah. So this was also a period when anxiety about the draft was oh, definitely God. on the rise. Yeah, uh, yeah right. Hmm. And the first of several draft lotteries took place in December of 69. Right. And this was shortly before you were about to graduate. Right, yeah. What was, I, uh, what was your situation vis-a-vis -vis uh, the draft? Uh, my situation was not so great. I, my lottery number was nine. Okay, so I was called up for a pre-induction physical. All right, so, um, so this is when I uh, became a, uh, a draft dodger. And um, so I did a couple of things. One, I got a passport, okay, just in case it meant leaving the country. Um, and... Um, and the other thing I did is I, uh, I, well, I, I looked into registering at a yeshiva in Brooklyn, um, sponsored by the Lubavitchers. It was called Hadar HaTorah. Uh, but the deal there was uh, you needed to come and study there a couple of days a week. Okay, and that would have been a little too difficult. So I didn't go that route, though I might have. Maybe I should have. <laughs> uh, and then the other way was uh, to put on uh, weight and somehow get my blood pressure up and, and fail the physical. So, um, and so I did that. I got my weight up. I was already a little bit on the heavy side, so I got my weight up and I worked on ways of getting my blood pressure up. And I went to Newark, New Jersey for the first physical. I also went up uh, dressed uh, like a chassid. Um, <laughs> And I uh, went up there, and, uh, and uh, I wasn't exactly, you know, willing to cooperate, obviously, with the system. And I refused to get undressed. And, um, but they were nice. They gave me, uh, they showed me a bunch of robes. I put a robe on, and, uh, you know, so I would uh, not be standing there naked with uh, all the other folks. And, it was really strange. I got out. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, for for overweight, and I, I failed failed the, the physical. The physical. Um, so and I had to go back uh, a year later to, to do it, do it all over again. But I got out actually because I failed the physical. <laughs> <coughs> so that was in seventy. Yeah. Just as that you was graduated. seventy. Yeah, as I was graduating, it was seventy. Yeah, sometime in seventy. Um, I worked at Camp Ramah um, the summer of 70. I was a teacher. Uh, I had been trained also in the, uh, through the seminary in the Milton uh, method of teaching, um, which is the method of inquiry. I also I learned uh, te how to teach um, uh, Hebrew um, through the dialogue method called Biad HaLashon. Uh, so I was um, a teacher on, on staff there and... Um, uh, there's a rabbi came up from, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life after that. You know, I, I wanted to continue the activism, and at that time there was really only one group in the country that sounded really interesting to me, and that group was called Jews for Urban Justice. And, uh, and I'd been to the Washington, D.C. area. I'd gone camping in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and I liked the area. I, I really wanted to get out of New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> 
So I, I was attracted, and this rabbi comes up from Washington. He was the associate rabbi at a uh, conservative synagogue. And he uh, meets me, he sees me, whatever, doing my thing, and I was also playing guitar and this and that. So he says, listen, and he knew about you know, my background organizing uh, the Chavarat in New Brunswick. He says, listen, I, would you like a job? Uh, we need someone to teach, but we also have a, um, uh, um, a member of our community who wants to buy a house and create a Chavara for teenagers, you know, because they're not coming to the synagogue. And this would be a great way to bring the teenagers. They can have their own place. They don't have to bother with us. And so I said, wow, that's great. I would love to do it. So, uh, so he pretty much hired me on the spot. And after, uh, after uh, uh, camp, I went down to uh, Washington and, um, and uh, met the principal and started teaching. And what community was this? Uh, B'nai Israel uh, Synagogue. Is the, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, conservative congregation in the Washington area. It's the, I think the second largest conservative congregation there. Uh, they now have a building, their, their center is right over here, two blocks away. Um, but at that time, they still were meeting downtown D.C. And, and also had a school out in the burbs. So I um, started teaching there and, uh, and, and starting working with the youth group. But the problem was the person who was going to buy the house uh, withdrew his offer. So the Chavara wasn't going to happen. Meanwhile, I was uh, looking for a community for myself, and I, you know, I around the same time connected with uh, Jews for Urban Justice, and got involved with uh, their activities. Uh, didn't have. Tell us a little bit about that. How many people were involved with JUJ? Uh, JUJ, hard to say. The meetings I went to, uh, and the Friday nights, maybe as many as thirty people. I, it's hard to remember. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, and it was nice. Um, it didn't feel like uh, cozy or like a, a chavara, the kind of feeling that we had in New Brunswick. Um, and, it, and at one of those Friday night meetings, I met Rob Agus. Okay? And uh, Rob and I hit it off uh, immediately. And uh, you know, sharing something about our backgrounds and... and uh, and then he lays out his, his vision. I said, wow, it's great. Count me in. <laughs> his vision was? His vision was to create a Jewish uh, counterculture center. I think that was the terminology he was using at the time. Um, uh, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And uh, that would be uh, the, the creation of a, of a holistic Jewish community with different aspects, you know, we'd have a center, but then we'd have like these, uh, uh, might not be his exact, his exact words, because who remembers, it's uh, 46 Almost years 50. ago. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, spokes on the wheel, we'd have our own uh, school, we'd have, a, uh, we'd have a restaurant, we'd have a place in the country, we, you, know, have, you know, a hub for Chavurot, you know, and, and it was like, wow, what a coffee house. You know, services, I mean, so it was like, you know, meeting the needs of young people in D.C. I said, wow, this is great. You know, so, um, so I, I signed on, and, and he uh, then uh, started also fundraising. Um, and this is the aspect. He did, you know, virtually all the administrative stuff, the development stuff, the fundraising. I had virtually nothing to do with, with any of that. And he wrote a concept paper, I guess. The concept paper, yeah, of course, um, mm -hmm. which uh, I may have around someplace. I, mm. I, I, I used to have better files and then moving here and there and, and a lot of stuff that from those days is probably at our retreat center, uh, not in the country. But, um, so, uh, but he, you know, but he needed, uh, uh, he obviously needed help and he so... I became part of the team, and uh, another person, a, a lawyer who he knew, named Peter Went. Did he tell you about Peter? Peter Went. Went, W-E-N-D-T. Peter Went. Uh, uh, he, I forget how he knew him, um, but he brought him in to help with the development of the coffee house and to do uh, draft counseling because we also did draft counseling at the original for bringing. Rob got uh, funding um, from the federation. Well, it wasn't called the federation at the time. It was called the United Jewish Appeal. Uh, and he convinced them that we were going to save their youth. And uh, <laughs> you know, did, he, yeah. did he talk about that? Did he get into that piece of it? Yeah. He did? Okay. 
Uh, a little bit, a little bit. A little bit. Uh, say what you would say about no, it. No, no. So I, 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 you know, so we got a nice sum of money to get get things off. Fifteen thousand. Yeah. Okay. So for get, six months. Yeah, for six months. Exactly. Right. To get things off the ground, we found a beautiful place on Florida Avenue, a four-story a former convent building, uh, and uh, and I became the resident staff person. I already had a place out in the burbs, and I had a job, so I didn't need to, you know, get uh, an, uh, have a salary. What uh, did resident is, staff person mean in a mountain? I mean, I was I was there at night. I, I slept. You lived, there. You lived, I lived, lived there. there. I lived on the fourth floor. I had my own room on the fourth floor. Um, and and I was basically there taking care of the place, you know, uh, you know when no one else was there in the in the evenings, and providing a presence, you know, um, in that sense. And uh, so we uh, uh, we created, a, you know, amazing program there, you know, over you know within a shorter period of time. We what do we do? Um, and where did the name come from? Oh. From uh, Rob and I were, as I, re yeah, well, as I uh, recall, I don't remember exactly where it was, but it was in D.C. where we were sitting and talking about the name this thing, okay? Name this community. And, um, and the name, the word for Brennan came up. You know, and it resonated with both of us, as uh, I clearly recall. And um, I had, had ex I personally had, and maybe Rob did too, with the Fabrengen in uh, at 770 Eastern Parkway. I had been to a couple of Fabrengens up there. And the word, I like the sound, I like the sound of the word. And I think Rob liked the sound of the word. Uh, we probably didn't get the spelling right, as uh, people have uh, noted to us. And, and, and uh, did Rob tell you his reason for... for what were the reasons? His as I recall, because we the, the R was left out, okay? First in far. So when you pronounce it, it sounds like Fabrengen. You don't hear the R, okay? And um, so one of the reasons, I don't know if Rob came up with this, I don't remember, it's been so long, um, that, well, R stands for rabbi, and, um, and, and this is not, you know, rabbi-centric, this, uh, this way of... Uh, you know, kind of organizing in the community, and we didn't want it to be a top-down kind of, and which which is part of the Chavara philosophy, you know, that it is a fellowship, it's a cooperative, that there is no one person who is is so central, and certainly not necessarily rabbi, you know, rabbi-led. You so, had said that you'd been to several Fabrengans. Well, a couple in New York City. What were they? Oh, well, Fabrengan on a Friday, on a Saturday night. Um, you know, Moshe uh, Shabbat after after Shabbat, the Hasidim would pack into uh, the hall at Seventy Seven East Parkway, and the Rebbe, with his um, council or his, the other elders would come out, and he would sit, and people would be singing Nigunim and you know, sh and, and swaying back and forth Nigunim or melodies, um, and uh, all men, the women. We don't know where the women were. I'm sure they had uh, a place, maybe to hear. I, I I never even asked the question at that time, and, but it was a pretty awesome experience being there. And uh, uh, Rebbe would speak. It was all in Yiddish, and the person who took me, uh, a uh, he was able to translate a little bit. But it was kind of an awesome experience, and and um, and I was I was always attracted since a teen as I not always as a teenager to Hasidism. You know, and the spirituality that um, you know that was of the Hasidic uh, tradition, especially in its formative uh, period, and uh, Hasidism actually is very much informed. You know, those of us in, in developing new spiritual communities and new uh, and, and, and and development of Chavarot. So, you know, to experience that was was special because I I knew something of the background. Um, for me, it had other meaning too, because my my last name is Schneer, and the the Alter Rebbe, um, is, uh, his name was uh, uh, Schneer Zalman, you see, and uh, and his and those who followed him were Schneer's son, you see. So there's a I've always felt an affinity because of the of of the name, and um, that and and uh, and also also the mystical tradition on another side of my. Family, my mother, my my maternal, my paternal side, my grandmother on my uh, my father's mother was a Luria, 
So we have, you know, kind of, so, so I always grew up with this kind of awareness of, of somehow connection, even though it never was, you know, documented, you know, to uh, the Hasidic and the mystical traditions. Um, when I went to Israel for the first time, I didn't go right to Jerusalem. I actually, I, I was drawn to Tzfat. I went to Tzfat, you know. So it's that kind of thing. It just, you know, that kind of... Uh, so all of this had calling. resonance for you as you were talking with Rob about this. Oh, yeah, tremendous interview. resonance. Yeah, back to thank you. Uh, tremendous resonance. Rob and we uh, were close. We developed uh, the coffee house, uh, the davening, how we would do... We'll get to that in one second. No, oh, later? Okay. Yeah, yeah, one sec. But tell me, what's, what was the, the... Just these early activities as you were getting um, going. Early activities. What was the coffee uh, house? Well, coffee, uh, mm-hmm. Saturday nights, um, people get together and... Uh, um, uh, just, what do we do? I, I don't remember specifically. There would, there would be some singing. This... Poetry. I, I know something. I don't remember the specifics of the coffee mm-hmm. house. And I probably, since someone else, it was Peter, I think, that was organizing more of the coffee houses. Um, I may not have gone to as many that first year that, that he was there. Because, see, after the first six months, we lost our funding. Or we were not, we didn't lose it. We were just not refunded um, for interesting reasons. Um, but uh, so, all, so the coffee houses, we had a few. Um, he did the draft counseling. I was responsible for putting together a, um, the educational programs, like we had a Jewish study, um, what do we call it, an Institute for Jewish Studies, uh, which morphed later into the Jewish Study Center, which then separated from Fabrengen uh, several years later and became its own 501c3. Um, Fabrengen ultimately gave birth to a number of, you know, the original Fabrengen. We had a bit of a collective, a, a musician and artist collective, that uh, met at Fabrengen, that did workshops. Um, uh, Rob's, um, his roommate Paul Rutke, did he mention someone named Paul Rutke? Mm-hmm. Um, a, a wonderful artist who then later became an Orthodox Jew, was living in Baltimore too. Um, uh, he had a workshop there and uh, I gathered the musicians and we started creating our own uh, music. I can show you, I have a show and tell here. <laughs> Um, this is the uh, first album that, um, that we created uh, at Fabrengen, the Fabrengen Fiddlers. And on the back, it talks about the Fabrengen community, some of these old photos. I don't know where the originals are. So we uh, created the musical environment for the design on the front was created by Stu Copan. I have to mention Stu Copans because uh, he was very involved in Fabrengen those years. Uh, Stu Copans. Uh, is the, um, the illustrator of the Jewish catalogs. You see, another connection between us and the other, other Chavurot. Uh, although for Brengen, when we started for Brengen, um, we were not a Chavurah at, at, at first. For those first six months, you know, um, it would be hard to call us a Chavurah because the vision was much greater than, you know, a Chavurah, which is a more inward kind of focused concept, you know, that... Uh, you know, that's sort of limited, perhaps in numbers, by this, by what a chavara means. Well, how do you distinguish between the vision for, for Brengen and what the other chavarot were doing and, and also represented to you? Well, the original for Brengen uh, was a, a center doing outreach, you know, to, to doing outreach in order to create a more holistic Jewish community. And, um, but not a small intentional it wasn't, membership community the way the others were. Yeah, we, that was not the intention of the original for Brengen, uh, certainly as I recall. Uh, it, uh, it became that, you know, out of necessity, you know, because when we lost the funding, we could no longer do, we didn't have the funding, we didn't have staff. We had to move out of the building that we had to a smaller facility. Mm-hmm. We, um, so I wanna, let, let's get to that, because I, I want sure. to... Um, Talk a little bit more about the the uh, background to wh- what happened um, when you lost the funding. So, so we're going to go back. To, I just want to um, have you read. This is again looking at your the first album uh, okay. from the Fabring and Fiddlers. So read the little blurb on the back, please. Okay. <laughs> This record has grown out of the coming together, that's what Fabrengen uh, means, of creative talents in an atmosphere of new Jewish discovery and rediscovery. 
of a tradition once thought lost and of a future once thought abandoned. It is the rediscovery of a tradition which has not been transmitted, transmitted from parent to child in recent Jewish generations in America, a tradition truncated to meet the diminishing demands of an assimilating American Jewry, the searing indictment of the Hebrew prophets and their call to return, the joy and pathos of the Hasidic masters, the belief in a God at once personal and omnipotent, a yearning for a way, in, in quotes, which will enable Jews growing up and, making, and seeking livelihoods to attach meaning to every part of their lives, and the discovery of untapped means of opening up in, to feeling close to people, to learning, to working in a communal environment, to social and political action. Uh, Jews are nothing without each other. We can't be Jewish by ourselves. We survive or not, grow or not, as a community. Um, let's see what, uh, the songs and arrangements on this record were created like the Shabbos meals, like the silkscreen posters, uh, dashikis with tzitzit, and other for bringing arts and crafts because Jewish communal spirit gives them meaning. Shiru Ladonai Shir Chadash, it is a new song we are singing. And, uh, that, and that, those words are all, was also, all, I also set to music and became like the, the theme song, I guess, of the early Fabrengen. Should I do it? Yes. So uh, this song was uh, created for Fabrengen. Um, I guess we started singing it like the first month. Shiru Ladonai Shir Chadash. Sing to God a new song. Sing to God all the earth. Bless God's name. Shiru Ladonai, Shiru Ladonai, Shiru Ladonai, Shir Hadash. Shiru Ladonai, Shiru Ladonai, Shiru Ladonai. Shiru Adonai, Kol Haaretz. Shiru Adonai, Baruch Hu Shemo. Shiru Adonai, Kol Haaretz. Shiru Adonai, Baruch Hu Shemo. Sing to Adonai, sing to Adonai, sing to Adonai a new song. Sing to Adonai, sing to Adonai, sing to Adonai a new song. Sing to Adonai, oh, the earth. Sing to Adonai and bless the name. Sing to Adonai, oh, the earth. Sing to Adonai and bless the name. Other melodies that were created during that, that period, if we have time, we have yeah. to share but them. Let's go back for a moment to the relationships that existed in the beginning between Fabrengen and JUJ and <laughs> their relationships to the larger Jewish community. Uh, okay, well, JUJ um, was a much more activist kind of organization, it had a more political purpose. And was much more of a thorn in the, uh, you know, in the Jewish community. <laughs> um, I got involved with JJ in 1970 when I first came down, and some of their more um, radical actions uh, had already taken place, like releasing uh, white rice on the White House lawn, for example, or pouring red paint on grapes at a giant uh, food market, or 
dumping shmatas on the table of the um, Jewish Community Council uh, at their board meeting um, in protest of the way uh, Jew uh, Jewish realtors and, and uh, apartment owners and builders did their work. Um, you know, so, so it was a strained relationship that JUJ had with the Jewish community. Uh, here, oh, there's the, the, the action when the Jewish Community Center was opening up here in Rockville, Rockville. just down the street. Uh, they were, you know, uh, at, the, uh, at that time, the E.J. Corvette uh, Shopping Center. Um, they were busing people there, you know, to see, to visit the Jewish Community Center, the new Jewish Community Center for the first time, because there wasn't enough room, apparently, on the, on the grounds to park everyone. So they were, you know, busing people over. So because the Jewish Community Center for a number of people in JUJ represented, you know, kind of um, an erosion of Jewish values and, and Jewish content culturally, religiously, spiritually, um, you know, it, uh, and it, you know, a center for uh, maybe assimilation, <laughs> that's how it was perceived by some. Uh, there were people from JUJ sitting outside uh, the buses uh, with signs saying, this is the bus to Auschwitz. Pretty heavy, okay? So JUJ was not, you know, not in a place of great, didn't have the love of the Jewish community at all. Um, and so when we, uh, uh, this, you know, so when we were creating uh, for Brengen, uh, um, you know, Rob, um, I think, you know, rightfully felt that there needed, needed to be a major distinction. We were not going to get, we needed the support of the Jewish community um, financially. Um, Primarily, I think, and uh, in some ways, they're they're a blessing, you know, and and I think it was also felt that it was important to have the established Jewish community involved in this new way. Um, so, uh, so there had to be a distinction between JUJ and Fabrengen. Uh, so, meanwhile, the vision of Fabrengen had been presented at JUJ meetings. And there are some people in JUJ who felt that, you know, some ownership for, the, for this concept of a Jewish counterculture center. Um, and, uh, but when Rob and, uh, and I and, and others started organizing for Brangen and creating our own board, um, it, it became this uh, very uh, difficult um, situation where the, these two bodies were talking about this emerging... Uh, center. So that became increasingly uncomfortable. When we got uh, Fabrengen off the ground, a number of folks who had been involved with JUJ uh, kind of gravitated to us. And, um, and, and, then, and the, the activities of, of JUJ became their coffee house that they had, uh, became less and less uh, active. They became less active, less significant. Um, the last major action of JUJ was in December of 1970 when uh, 13 of us were arrested, you know, across the street from the former Soviet embassy, protesting um, the arrest of uh, Jews. Jews. This is the, the, the period of the Leningrad trials. And, uh, so that was the last, you know, significant action that we, we brought out, I don't know, a couple hundred people to this protest and 13 of us didn't move fast enough. So folks like Arthur Waskow and uh, I think I think Rob was also arrested and uh, and um, uh, Michael Tabor, uh, a number of folks uh, who later become more and more involved with Fabrenga were arrested. So that was the last action. Then things as Fabrenga got off the ground, um, it didn't seem to make sense um, for JUJ to continue, but the level of political activity also could not take place within Fabrengen, because Fabrengen, we were essentially a, a, a cultural, countercultural center. Um, uh, we were not defined, you know, solely by, uh, by the politics. Was there a sense within Fabrengen, those forming Fabrengen, that there were strings attached in some sense to the UJ funding, in terms of what kinds of activities you would do or not do, or mm. particular relationship between J.U.J. and Fabrengen? Uh, I personally didn't feel there were strings attached, you know, to the funds. I had never was ever said, you, you can't do this because of that and whatever. Um, I mean, ultimately, because of some of the things we did, 
there were uh, a few people in the UJA, established Jewish community, the Jewish Community Council, that seriously felt, you know, we were a threat to the Jewish community. Right. Um, you know, so, but we never felt there were strings attached, you know, uh, in the six months that we operated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was not the... Michael, the Michael Staub writes in Torn at the Roots, his book Torn at mm -hmm. the Roots, um, that most people at the time accepted that Verbrengen was the non-political sort of wing of J.U.J., and others felt that J.U.J. in fact became Verbrengen. Do either of those resonate for you? Not at all. <coughs> yeah, not okay. at all. I know people have thought that, mm -hmm. um, and there are some people who would like that to be the narrative, but I never, I never felt that. Uh, never felt that at all. Um, so J J was formally abandoned, right, in 1971. Uh, yeah, formally, uh, yeah, dissolved. Yes. Dissolved. Yeah, formally. Um, Summer. Yeah, formally, in July. formally dissolved. Yeah. Uh, so that was almost six months after Verbrengen had gotten off the ground. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it was pretty much over, you know, by March of that of that six month period. We opened our doors the end of January, in seventy one. Are they related? What? The yeah. dissolving of JUJ and the. Yeah, I think so. Um, although there are a lot of people who had been involved with JUJ who were not involved with Verbrengen. And and to say we were you know not not politicals is kind of wrong. Um, I mean, in May of that of that year, I mean, Fabringa became a center for the March on Washington. We housed dozens of people came in for the you know for the march, for the uh, protests, anti-war protests. Uh, we became a medical center, you know, a, a first aid center. At that time, um, I mean, we, we were working in the center and, and f feeding people, and and the wafts of of, of, of tear gas coming through the building because uh, we're just two blocks from Dupont Circle, so that's pretty political. <laughs> <laughs> we were, I mean, Fabrenga was listed on the House on American Activities list, you know, independently of JUJ, so yeah. you know, it's a kind of. So what happened? Why did why did the Federation decided to cut off funding after those six months. Hey, got to you. Yes, what a story. Um, well, I think the principal reason uh, had to do with, um, uh, you know, some folks in Fabrenga uh, talking about, uh, you know, a, regarding the Palestinians. It had to do mostly with Israel. Um, at talking about a two-state solution to this problem, um, there was so that kind of discussion was going on. Uh, there were people in Fabrengen, formerly in JUJ, who were much more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause than than others, and they, even though they were not uh, representing the Fabrengen, you know, their presence there was picked up, I think, by uh, the Jewish Community Council who uh, planted spies at the Verbringen to report on us. I don't know if uh, anyone else had talked about this yet. Did no one talked about it yet? Not in that, at that level. That level? But it would be Should cool. I? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. This is a historical uh, record. Yeah, there was an incident where I was very involved in, in Soviet Jewry as well. Um, I mentioned the arrest and that, and I had got involved with the Union of Councils for Soviet Jury. There was a Washington branch called the Washington Council for Soviet Jury. Uh, and um, uh, I was at the Jewish Community Council office one day in, maybe it was April or May, something like June, something like that, maybe June, July, it was around that period, uh, to speak with uh, someone there, one of their staff people, about Soviet Jewry, okay? So I'm sitting waiting for the opportunity to speak to him. And, uh, and the secretary calls out, so-and-so is called to report on Verbrengen. Okay, just right there, right in front of me. She didn't know who I was. So, so, 
So uh, meanwhile, the, the staff person comes uh, comes out to uh, he, he to acknowledge this call, and sees me, and we look at each other, and I said, "Well, I guess we have nothing to talk about." And I and I walked out. I just left at that point because we had suspected, you know, that there had been um, people checking us out, you know, and um, so that uh, that really. You know that really bothered us. Um, so that's a, that's an example of a kind of the relationship. But 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 and I guess at that time we were getting more involved. I guess in maybe in anti-war stuff a little bit more. There was the, of course, we housed all those folks. So there was the anti-war issue, uh, and then the Palestinian issue. Um, over the summer, we hired uh, for that summer a rabbi, uh, 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 Gilman, uh, Mark. I think is his first name. Gilman. Uh, yeah, Gilman. A reform rabbi. Um, he came in. He might not have been a rabbi at the time. Maybe a rabbinical student. I forget. I'm sorry, sorry, Mark, if you're listening to this. Um, and he helped us organize the the summer study programs at Fabringen. Um, this is the same summer that George and I were uh, renting a place out in the in the country in George or- Johnson. George Johnson in Orlean, Virginia, which we gave the name Far Out. And we used it for our, our own enjoyment, but also as a place where Fabringeners could come and have retreats. Um, so, uh, so he was there, and, and there was a protest. At that time, the, the, there's the Black September uh, movement that was coming down uh, heavily on, on, on the Palestinians in refugee camps on Israel-Jordan's border. And, um, and, and, and so we were asked, I forget how this happened, because I wasn't at Fabringen that summer, most of that summer to really respond, or at least that part of the summer. Um, but we were invited to be, participate in a protest at the Jordanian embassy, you say, on behalf of the Palestinians, to join the solidarity. Fabringen, Fabringen members were involved, or whoever was there. Not Fabringen to be a sponsor, but the announcement was made at Fabringen to, uh, to inviting people to be part of this protest at the Jordanian embassy in support of the Palestinians uh, who, um, who were subject to, uh, to violence from the Jordanian government. Anyway, so this got out, okay, to the Jewish community. And the headlines in the Jewish week, and I have the paper someplace downstairs, uh, called um, Al Fatah Goes to Shul. Okay? Shul, we being the Shul, Al Fatah being the Palestinians. And here we are, you know, um, painted as an organization that is, uh, you know, in support of Palestinians. And, and this, of course, raised a red flag, you know, making us, in the eyes of some people in the Jewish community, uh, maybe anti Israel, you know, which is absolutely ridiculous. And so, um, uh, so that, you know, so that was the beginning of uh, that, that, plus the anti war activity. Um, Plus the fact that we were not really accountable to uh, to them, you know, like there were, you know, some people say there were strings. Well, some people may have wanted strings, but there were really no strings, as I recall. Um, but there were some people who really wondered about us. And so what happened, they, it was a, 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 a I don't know if, if Rob uh, talked about this, but the, the, the Federation or the Jewish, and the Jewish Appeal convened a meeting <coughs> Where um, to hear both sides? It was like a courtroom scene. The, yeah. So you had um, some, I guess, attorneys up front, and people were being interviewed on both sides. You know, should Fabrengen, you know, be f- funded, refunded, or not? So we had, you know, was, uh, this went on. It was like really painful. Let me tell you. Uh, listening to this, ultimately they decided, at least that committee, that body, that. Bet din or whatever they called themselves, that we, you know, we were we were okay. Based know. on what you had, what, what the but, but what you know, but work. what what our supporters had to say, I think, mm-hmm. that we were worthy of um, of support. You know, given the educational programs, the arts programs, the the davening, the whole thing that, you know, we were doing what we had been our mission was essentially. You know, um, the other stuff, you know, yeah, that happened, but it wasn't integral, you know, to our primary purpose, you see. So, 
so we passed the test there and we made it through another committee, the youth committee. We even made it through the budget committee and then there at the executive committee. This is where I, as I, as I recall, because it's been a long time where it stopped, there was a particular um, philanthropist who said, well, if, uh, if you continue, if you decide to fund for bring and I'm taking, I'm withdrawing my whatever contribution, which was substantial to the Jewish community. So at the, on the executive level, uh, they decided not to refund us. I hope I have that history right, because um, it's been a long time. Yeah. What were the feelings within Fabrenia as all of this unfolded? Well, I mean, the, what was the impact on the community? Oh, the impact was pretty severe. I mean, we knew we couldn't continue to pay staff. I mean, Rob was drawing a salary. Peter was drawing a salary. We had rent to pay, um, other expenses. We knew that we could not... Uh, continue in the same, the same way. One of the reasons why we created this album was to raise money for the Fabrengen. And we, we raised several hundred dollars, enough to pay for another month's rent. You know, I wish we could have raised more. So, but that was one of the motivations for getting the album out. Um, and it came out, I think, in the summer of 71. I think that was, that was the time. Uh, you know, so it had a major impact. We could no longer do... The original vision changed. And, uh, and gradually... Um, but a community had been built up. A tremendous community. We had a couple hundred people identifying with Fabrengen. You know, coming to our programs fairly regularly is outrageous. That in such a short time that it would have such a... So there would be such a response. So, um, so from out of that, that first six months emerged um, the Chavura basically, the Chavara. And, uh, and, and, and then there were all offshoots. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, Let, let's sort of delve into this a little bit more. I want to I'm understand sorry. more fully what you mean when you say the Chavara emerged out of this. Uh, well, the, the Chavara, the Fabrengen as a Chavara, as a fellowship community, uh, not as an outreach institution, okay, um, with a you know with a larger vision, I think it became more insular. Um, it insular in the in, sense of well, inward focus in, on in, on the people who were on the people involved. who people who were involved and to uh, maintain maintain that community you know and then to see what would happen you know down the road. I don't think Lo Rob ever lost sight of the original vision, um, but uh, and he. Yeah, I certainly know he wasn't happy about it, and um, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what else to say. I, I at that point I started. Uh, this was seventy one. It was still seventy one. Um, I started withdrawing a little bit to focus on other other things. Um, I got more involved with the musicians. The the musicians that for bringing uh, we formally became the Fabrengen Fiddlers, and we started out sort of like a collective, as you wish, but then we became more, uh, uh, more focused on our own kind of unit and began doing more gigs in the community, and our, part of our um, purpose, or what we saw ourselves as doing, was to bring Jewish music, music and also Jewish dance, back into the Jewish community. Um, there were those of us who were interested in the, in the Jewish arts. And we started um, evolving the concept of a Jewish uh, arts society, which we, I think in 1973, gave the name the Jewish Folk Arts Society. Uh, Stu, Stu Kopans, the illustrator of the Jewish catalogs, was one of the uh, co-signers, myself and uh, Sue Romer. Um, the, some of the members of Fabrengen branched off and created uh, the Fabrengen Cheder community, the Fabrengen Cheder, another Chavura, um, in, based in Silver Spring Tacoma Park. Arthur and his children became central in that, primarily focused on educating their children. That's where uh, Sue Romer, um, Sue Romer is an important name in the development. Uh, Sue Romer. Sue Romer. Um, when I uh, first met her, I met her, she was also a music teacher at one of the synagogues I uh, worked at. I was teaching music in the upper school. 
she was teaching music in the nursery school. Uh, we met then, this is uh, 72. Um, and I'd heard about her before because she had been to, in 1970 or 69, 70, when she first came to Washington. She did a couple of J.U.J. coffee houses, did, uh, sang Yiddish labor music and, and Yiddish, other Yiddish music. And uh, so she had a wonderful reputation coming from a more secular Jewish background. Um, she then became much more involved in, in synagogue life and in Jewish liturgical music. Uh, she learned from several people. I was one of her teachers in that, in that area and others. And she became the cantor for Temple Beth Ami for 25 years, a reformed temple. And uh, uh, also was one of the founders of the Fabrengen Cheder community that Arthur was involved with, this other Chavura in, based in the Burbs. So you, you, did they consider themselves a separate Chavura? So people were yeah. to more than one Chavura. Uh, yeah, Arthur still was connected to Fabrengen, um, as more as a Davenin community. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Cheder was not a Davenin community, it was more for the education of their children. They met principally on Sunday mornings. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so that was a brand, that branched off. The music, the the artists we created um, by '73, we had incorporated the Jewish Folk Arts Society, um, but we didn't actually really do anything significant until 1977, when we ran the Jewish first Jewish Folk Arts Festival, which was co-sponsored by the Jewish Folk Arts Society, the Kosher Kitchen Collective, Kosher which was also a, essentially a chavura. 77, and Fabrengen. So it was the Jewish Folk Art Society, Fabrengen. And because Fabrengen, you know, even though it became a chavura, more in, and a davening chavura, principally, um, you know, the, there still was this vision of, uh, of enriching the larger Jewish community through these, mm -hmm. uh, these other, uh, through the arts and through mm -hmm. other forms of spirituality. Yeah. Um, so yeah. anyway. let's um, go back. I want to look at some of the aspects of uh, for bringing as as a chavara. Um and so let's focus for a minute on on the idea of of chavara as community to start mm -hmm. with. So um, as it was evolving in this sort of next phase post post the first six months, um, how how would you describe? Um, Sort of the community of Verbringen as it was taking shape. Who who was in? Who was part of Verbringen, and where were they coming from? In the Chavura, mm -hmm. um, as, as it became more of a Chavura, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people like George Johnson and Chavo Weisler and um, Rob, of course, Max Tickton had come to the Washington D.C. area. He and Esther, yeah. Esther uh, in 1972, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, they became integral to the Chavura that, that was emerging. Um, you know, partly existed and partly emerging. It was, you know, it's kind of organic. Mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, I mean, there are lots of other people I'm not mentioning. Uh, I just knew, what, what yeah. were the kinds of people who were attracted to? Not necessarily oh, the kinds people. of people. Yeah. Uh, people looking for, um, for community. People who are... Uh, Many of whom were largely single, I think. Um, uh, the, uh, what kinds of Jewish backgrounds were they bringing in general? Or was it very eclectic? Uh, many people coming with good Jewish backgrounds, as I recall. Uh, I, mean, I mean, those of us who started for bringing in, I mean, Rob and myself, uh, pretty strong backgrounds. The Chava, a very strong background, uh, mostly conservative. Uh, some people with um, uh, maybe formerly orthodox backgrounds. There was more, tr you know, more uh, more traditional grounding, but people who were alien felt alienated from established uh, established synagogues, but also the need for uh, uh, shared values. I mean, yeah, I mean that was kind of the part of the need and and a certain way of of, of doing it. Uh, the the need for being part of an egalitarian community in the early seventies. <laughs> Very few synagogues are egalitarian. I mean, uh, as I remember, I mean, I, as I know, my experience, we're the first community to, you know, uh, that, I can, that I know that, you know, that where women had the same, there was, no, there was no difference. You know, and the language, we, the language of liturgy, we, 
It was not even, there was no debate over, you know, imahot, of the matriarchs. Right from the beginning. Right from the beginning, as I recall. Right from the beginning, there was no, you know, so we might have talked about it for two minutes. I, you know, <laughs> you, know I, you know, that was, that was it. And, uh, you know, music, you know, playing musical instrumentation on Shabbat, you know, that was, that was not an issue. Good. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, I want to get into because you want you would, no no other conservative synagogue there was no other shul in town where folks with a good Jewish background could go and have that kind of experience. Right. Yeah. Outside of classes and religious services, communal communal meals and community meetings were an important way that the community came together on regular occasions, right? Right. So, what kinds of communal meals were there? Um, when did the community come together for meals, and and what role did they play in the community? Well, when we the original center, the four-story former convent building, the uh, we had um, we had meals every Friday night. We had potluck dinners every wasn't was a potluck. Now I forget how we did the meals, um, but we had food. Rob there. said, I believe that. He helped cook in the beginning, and then it became potluck eventually. Is that what happened? That's what he yeah, said. Yeah, uh, yeah. My recollection of exactly yeah. how that happened. Uh, but yeah, so we had we had food. Yeah, was, every, every holiday that we had, food was integral. Um, and the, the gathering was on Friday night. On Friday night, that that gathering, and we had kiddush too on Saturday mornings. We also had regular davening on Saturday mornings. Um, and the holidays, uh, Pesach seder's. Uh, mm-hmm. Although at that time I was already involved, where was I during Pesach Seder? I don't remember. Probably visiting relatives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember participating in Pesach Seder. Maybe one or two. In, you know. yeah. Can you can you go back and try and just yeah. describe what those Friday night meals were like in the in the beginning as they were as Fabrengen was mm-hmm. taking shape. Well, people would. Uh, there was like a buffet, as I recall, and people would take their food and they would sit. You know, on the first floor, uh, we'd had a, had a living room, dining room area. People would sit wherever they could sit. Uh, it wasn't like we had tables where people sat around. But that I don't. Were they uh, sitting uh, at tables or on no, the or on the floor? Or? No, they were on on that floor, on that floor of the uh, of, of the Fabrenga building. Uh, people were sitting in chairs on cushions on, on uh, uh, couches. Okay, as I recall. Um, when we had the davening later in the uh, evening or before we ate, <coughs> and which preceded which I'm not, I don't remember, <laughs> um, we we had cushions, and in fact in the photograph you can see I think, uh, oh it's not here, <laughs> but this is a, this is a photograph of a Friday night after, uh, where it's the This one. Yeah, we're d- we're doing the chadodi. And uh, when, I don't know if you can pick this up. Okay. Uh, and uh, at the end, we're sitting in kush, on cushions, and we're and and, and we're doing Hasidic nuganim interspersed with um, with readings. You know, sometimes I would hand uh, I would pass around Martin Buber's ten Hasidic rungs and pick out a teaching from Martin Buber. Martin Buber was a, you know, a key philosopher, you know, of ours in. Uh, certainly of mine, and I also Rob too, uh, in 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 the vision of what Fabrenga uh, we wanted Fabrenga to become. Um, uh, so we sat on cushions, we sang, alternating, and it was kind of you know kind of the right balance of of music, okay, the emotive, you know, and also the the intellectual, the thought we were trying to be careful not to. It was very little talking, you know. It was mostly you know, listening. And singing, chanting, chanting, you know, chant. Well, chanting like Hasidic, Hasidic, Nigunim, Nigunim. Yeah. Um, and that was it. Did we, did we have a a prayer book? Um, I, I don't think we had a prayer book on Friday nights. Yeah. I don't think we used a prayer book. Is what kind a, of food got served? You know something. I don't remember. I was too busy even to eat. Oh no. <laughs> uh, no. I. What kind of food? Was uh, it? Were there? Principles of Kashrut in Oh yeah, no, no, we, was it absolutely. Dairy only or um, my vegetarian? recollection, I think it was vegetarian dairy. Bruce Wood, were yeah, it was. Or? It was not vegan, that's yeah. for sure. And organic was not a big uh, 
thing at that point. Uh, I think it was vegetarian dairy, as I recall. I, that's something I don't have a strong recollection of. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, did did for Did the and Chavarak yeah. community become an inviting community? Did people invite others in the community to their own homes for for other for other <laughs> meals, holiday meals, Shabbos yeah. meals? Uh, increasingly, not the first uh, six months or so, uh, mm-hmm. but increasingly as it became more uh, stronger, chavura and friendships became deeper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I uh, you know at that you know I, I I wasn't as involved at that point. You know, in uh, in that experience, um, yeah. yeah, I was in actually in seventy two, seventy three. I was in uh, seventy three, seventy four. I was in Israel. And then seventy four, seventy five, I was in Iowa. Right. You see, so I, you know, so, and, and in seventy two, I was kind of, um, you know, uh, working on other things. The things as well. Yeah. What do you remember about community meetings? Um, oh God, <laughs> they were painful <laughs> to me. Maybe other people enjoyed them. Now, they were. I haven't heard one person pretty much say that they really enjoy them. People talk about the intensity. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, some people it's intensity, some people it's, uh, sometimes it was painful. It's tense, I mean, uh, uh, because of people's different uh, ideas, I mean, different visions. And then there was the tension, you know, uh, I think from some of the people who were from the JUJ uh, you know, uh, community, um, there, was, there was some friction there. Uh, I, uh, you know, that was not a part of, I, I personally tried to stay out of, of that level of intensity or, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I was there trying to keep the peace, you know, mm-hmm. you know, more, that was, that was sort of my, I felt more my role. I, what was causing that degree of, of tension at these meetings? Were there sometimes there was issues? issues? Sometimes what, there was issues. What kinds sometimes of issues would cause that kind of tension? Political issues, you know, the role of you know politics, perhaps. Uh, <coughs> uh, I mean, that certainly was part of it. Uh, I was talking. I mean, uh, I remember, and this was during the first again, first maybe nine months that we're talking about when on, when we had these meetings where there was such tension. Um, uh, the people who were engaged much more, you know, in the struggle, you know, with each other, would have a much better recollection of the issues. Uh, with me, I, uh, um, you know, I, I, I saw it as, as a clash. I think also of certain personalities, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, I, I, I personally didn't engage in that, you know. So, yeah, yeah. So it's possible. It sounds like to become, you know really important part of this community and yet keep some distance from these well yeah I think there's a, even amongst the people who were you know um, disagreeing or arguing with each other there was an underlying you know love and, and, mm-hmm. and caring you know for each other as well and a respect for each other right. I mean that I think I always felt that outside the meetings I always felt that outside you know the meetings were like <clears throat> you know and then outside the meetings um you know, I uh, and and from in conversation with with uh, some of these individuals you know, over the years, there is a deep uh, there is respect, yeah. you know. Uh, respect. So I, I uh, that's how I perceive it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's focus on um, prayer and services at Fabrengen as they were taking shape. Um, and some some observers have pointed to an increased focus on prayer and study as opposed to political activism, it's sort of what you've been saying, as a result of the sort of cutting off of funding. Um, That's right. How would you describe um, the attitude towards prayer? What was tefillah in the, in the context of this community? Ooh, uh, tefillah was uh, on Friday nights, because there was a little bit of a difference between Friday night and Saturday morning, uh, Shabbat morning. Um, Friday night was more free form, more maybe um, spontaneous. Uh, we sat 
you know, well, also on Shabbat morning, we sat on cushions for the most part in a circle around the room. Um, Friday night, it was the alternating, uh, it was highly participatory. Uh, you know, it was not, people were not shuckling, like davening, shuckling like that. No, that wasn't it. Um, Nigunim, we, we learned a lot. Uh, one of my mentors, and I didn't mention this earlier, was Shlomo Karbak, uh, since I was in high school, actually. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I've performed with him, or backed him up a number of times. And How did you first meet him? I uh, first met him in, at a concert in 1966. I went up to him afterwards. I had got, I, I met him actually through his music first in 1963 or 64. A, a cantor in Lakewood gave me uh, an album of his. And I fell in love with the music and um, learned, all the, learned all the music. And then I went to this concert and uh, met him afterwards. And then when I went to Rutgers, um, heard that he was giving a concert there and uh, went to the concert. I took my guitar with me, just in case. He sees me, he remembered my name, <laughs> outrageous. And, uh, and so and when I came down to Washington um, in 1970, he called me up. He says, uh, oh, I was in contact with him to come um, at Rob's request to, uh, well, our discussion because we wanted to infuse Fabrengen with you know, some excitement. And we thought, wow, let's bring Shlomo in, you know, and help us open for, for a few times, um, almost like as a visiting scholar or something like that. And we set aside funds for that. We brought him in a few times I'd to... Four times. Four times? Yeah. A few times to basically uh, infuse the spirit and teach us through Hasidic teachings and music and... You know, take us to that level of, uh, of spirituality and meaningfulness, which most young Jews had never experienced. What was that like when he was actually there was, in the community? My experience was it was great. I mean, that was my experience. I mean, I've had, had that experience earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, when I came down to, and this is all part of, uh, in fact, in when, when I was having these discussions with Shlomo about you know, bringing him in, he said, he said, Hey, look David, as he would refer to me, Holy David, you know, make for me a concert in Washington. I said, Shlomo, I never, I, never made, I never made a concert before. He says, you can do it, you can do it. So I spoke to the folks at B'nai Israel Synagogue, and they said, yeah, sure. So, uh, so I got the space at their main building, uh, the social hall, and organized a concert for, it was sometime in December, either right before Hanukkah, and um, uh, organized a concert there, and I'm backing him up on one side, and I see this fiddler on the other side, backing him up, and then the concert was great, slow mo leaves, the fiddler, uh, we start talking, he's a student at the University of Maryland, and I said, wow, maybe we should get together. Okay, so we got together like uh, a week or two later, and he was the fiddler, he's the fiddler that I still play with in the Fabrengen Fiddlers. And his name is? Uh, Alan Oreski. Okay, Alan Oreski. And he then moved with his wife to the DuPont Circle area, or maybe they weren't married at that point yet, uh, and they became involved in Fabrengen. And they, he became part of that collective of musicians. So, um, so, that's, so Shlomo has had a very, very important role in, 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 in creating, uh, creating the atmosphere for being and teaching me. Because then I was, you know, I was you know, basically continuing his music. And so much of the music that we did, it was either his music or music that I, that I composed. Um, you know, I mean, I mean the band, the, the for Bringing Fiddlers, I guess might be probably the first if you want to give us a, a place in the in the archives, probably the first Jewish counterculture, you know, band. Part of the Jewish revival. Part of the Jewish, we'll call it. Uh, it wasn't folk known as renewal music. movement then, as the Jewish mm-hmm. counterculture, the Jewish uh, mm-hmm. folk music revival kind of. Folk thing? music revival music. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, some of us. I'm contemporaneous, of course, with um, with Debbie Friedman. And, uh, and others who were, who were creating new Jewish music at that at that time. Right. Um, so, uh, what was the question? We were talking about Friday night. And oh yes, yeah, so Friday night. So we service tefillah. Tefillah. So tefillah was like uh, an expression of joy, and some contemplation, and uh, and then dancing. You know, getting the whole body, whole you know, being into into the joy of community and and, and Shabbat. And I think that photograph uh, kind of represents that uh, in a way. That was every Friday night we would conclude 
Lachadodi with with dancing, and it was fabulous. It was fabulous. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Shabbat morning was structured a little more formally. We used a siddur. I don't remember which siddur we used. At the time, it might have been the old Sabbath and festival for a while. Which, no? Beer, oh, Birnbaum, right. <laughs> so, which we, of course, you know, took some liberties with. Uh, took some liberties with. And, um, and, and of course, the, uh, and there was you know, some good job, but more, it was more egalitarian chavura, more traditional egalitarian chavura style, as, as I remember. The Torah discussions were, were super. I mean, you know, it's not like we would read the whole parsha, but uh, at some point we uh, the focus became on on the convers- on on the meaning, on the interpretations that uh, came out of the out of the reading. Yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, it, Rob Agus was saying that uh, in the beginning of Fabrengen that the Friday night was the ser- the service Kabbalat Shabbat service and and meal. Oh yeah, and then later there was a mariv. Those who wanted to do a more traditional mariv, perhaps to say Kaddish, or just to have a mariv for the those folks coming from a more traditional background, there weren't that many. Uh, went back upstairs, you know, into our um, davening space, uh, mm-hmm. and had a service with Rob up there. And then Shabbat yeah. morning was really a Torah discussion. He was talking about the early days when it was. The, the uh, services were at the rack at the uh, oh Mission. rack was later was later rack was after okay after the the, the original the first ring was in the four story building yep and then we moved to another building um, a couple of, a block or so away um, after we lost the funding and then ultimately to the rack so uh, now I uh, don't recall Shabbat morning ever being Primarily, a you're saying discussion. it was basically. Oh, you don't. Mm, mm-hmm. No, uh-huh. no. It might have at one time after I left, you know. Um, but uh, it certainly was a very significant part of 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 the of the of, of the morning. But but there was all, there were also tefillot. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't go that often. Uh, Rob facilitated more than anyone else, and Chava I think was very involved on Shabbat morning. More than I did because I had other commitments on Shabbat morning with the uh, my work in the suburbs. suburbs yeah. yeah. Um, can you describe some of the innovative features of the service and, and approaches to davening at Febreng and what what was going to become Kabbalah style mm-hmm. davening as you were just mentioning? Well, I think it varies very much from one Kabbalah to so, and to Brangen, another. What was it? So like here, so for me, I was I, I was the person who led for the most part the Kabbalah Shabbat, all right. So um, so my approach was okay. There are traditionally six psalms, okay, before Lachadudi, six for the six days of the week leading up to Lachadudi, and then another couple of psalms after that. Um, and so what I did, okay, so let's honor each of the six days of the week. And the way we did that was through a nigun, you know, a ver- based on a verse from Psalms. It may, it may have been one of the Psalms from the six. So it was a, a nigun, um, and then a, a short reading, or maybe a, a little Hasidic story, and back to a nigun. So we'd kind of go, go back and forth. It would be that, that kind of a flow. Um, and then culminating in uh, L'Chadudi. And the melody for L'Chadudi, uh, I wrote a melody for Fabrengham for L'Chadudi, and that became the, the principal melody, as long as I play it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
a condensed uh, version. Um, uh, it would get, uh, no, I, I sped it up a little much more quickly than we would normally do. We kind of build, uh, build up and then it gets faster. And one of the things I learned from Shlomo is that, you know, you start, you know, kind of um, more slowly, you know, and more contemplatively and, um, and reach a kind of a crescendo and it might be more ecstatic, you know, uh, even to the level of what's called devekis, you know, which is like the Hasidic idea of ecstasy, you know. And uh, when we were dancing in this picture, I mean, there was, there was an ecstasy. Um, and you can see it in people's faces, you know, as it became faster and more intense and, and on a higher level. Um, you know, so, so that, was, that was kind of the flow of the davening. Uh, liturgically, was Shlomo your sort of primary inspiration and teacher, or what other sources were you drawing on for in, in, musically? Yeah, musically. Uh, well, some of the you know folk singers of the '60s, mm -hmm. um, uh, Dylan, mm -hmm. Simon and Garfunkel. Um, you know, I, I definitely had an influence. You know, on me and uh, uh, Leonard Cohen, Hope Shalom. You know. um, in fact, just recently in our Chavara, we uh, devoted uh, a whole, we used his melodies all throughout our Shabbat service. Okay. So uh, occasionally I might, you know, occasionally I might incorporate, uh, like, uh, do something like this. Nei Shabbat Nikabla L'chad yodil Karat Kala Nei Shabbat Nikabla We might do that. Yeah. So, and everybody knew the reference. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you say what it is? That, that song? Yeah. Uh, uh, Scarborough Fair? Um, you know, Sounds of Silence goes wonderful with the Don Alum too. <laughs> you know, so, mm -hmm. A lot of melodies do. Um, so were we, you were you yeah. learning um, Nigunim from different uh, different Hasidic? Oh, absolutely. Masters? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, going back to high school, I mean, I would listen to Mujitzer. Um, ben Sion Schenker was the great Mujitzer composer of this century, uh, this past century. He recently died, um, in his 90s. And um, his sister lives around the corner, actually. Yeah, Ben Sion Schenker. And who else? Uh, Babaver melodies and Lubavitch melodies. So I would, you know, I, I, you know, I, I studied, studied uh, other Nigunim, I have anthologies. But in, the, in 1970, a couple of wonderful anthologies came out by uh, Belleville Pasternak of Terra Publications. You know, which became a, a major source of of uh, nigunim and you know from different traditions. So it wasn't only Shlomo, but um, you know, so much of it was inspired by Shlomo um, and other melodies, and also from the Israeli Hasidic song festivals. You know, those festivals, um, you know, also inspired from the Hasidic tradition. He produced and an, an, uh, much of the music that we, uh, we also incorporated into our davening, and then later as some of the other folk uh, cantors and folk singers, you, you know, emerged. Uh, Debbie Friedman and 
Jeff Clever, I mean, later on, and not so much in the early days of Fabrengen, that I mean, we didn't do any, uh, any of Debbie Friedman's music or any of the other, uh, there, were, there was no one else there, frankly. I don't remember anyone else there. Uh, the other only Jewish folk singer playing guitar besides Shlomo Karbach was Theodor Bikel. You know, who I also, uh, as a teenager, I mean, I, I studied his music. And, and, uh, yeah. Was Debbie Friedman, for instance, was her music integrated later in Fabringen as it became more, became more well known? I think some of it later on. Um, Mishabera, these uh, kinds of Mishabera, things. for sure. Uh, maybe Shalom Rav, Shalom Rav. Oh, that's not hers, that's not hers. That's uh, Jeff Klepper, actually. Oh. Um, yeah, that, I'm not so familiar with what Fabrengen is doing today, right, yeah. music, musically. Uh, we do, we incorporate uh, maybe one or two. Um, Shefa Gold, I mean, we have in, in the Movement for Jewish Renewal, you know, we have wonderful composers, Chana Teferet Siegel, who, uh, uh, the uh, wife of Daniel Siegel, a wonderful composer, and Shefa Gold, a wonderful composer. We, so we do incorporate more of their music into our davening than we do Debbie, Debbie Friedman, for example, and some of the others there. Yeah. Were there other ways that you can re- that recall that uh, Fabrengen tried to innovate? Uh, for instance, at Chavarat Shalom, there were uh, uh, attempts to use quiet, silence, um, or actual you know, meditation practices, those kinds of things. Did any of that happen at Fabrengen? Yes. Um, Maybe not as a regular thing, mm-hmm. uh, although we did um, at, at Far Out. Uh, at that time, I was I was studying yoga, so uh, I mean, uh, we mm-hmm. we may have done some yoga out there. I don't remember exactly what we did. Uh, How long did Far Out exist? As uh, a place? Basically, one summer. One summer. One summer. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> We didn't have a formal kind of yoga thing happening, as I call it. Meditation, we did a lot meditatively, but I don't recall us having like a, a set period of time. In, 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 in our Shabbat morning Chavara, in our community, now we do. Um, but I don't remember that being a significant part of, yeah. of our davening experience. Would you sing, as part of the davening experience, songs from the American folk tradition in English? Or some mm. of the, the people who were writing, posing Simon and Garfunkel, etc. See, at that time, um, in the davening that I led, I didn't, I didn't incorporate mm-hmm. much from the American folk tradition. Um, uh, I mean, me- melody-wise or with words? No, words, music? with words. words melody-wise, yes. You're saying, yeah, there was, yeah, yeah melody, melody wise, we might do that, but uh, we would do that. But mm-hmm. uh, I don't recall offhand if we uh, mm-hmm. if we did that. Yeah. Um, yeah, talk about the role of the Torah reading and the Torah discussion in, in services at for bringing. Oh, gosh. Um, well, again, uh, you know, in the we didn't read the entire sedra. We would read, um, I forget how many how many verses, and, and I wasn't there all the time on Shabbat morning because often I was uh, leading services elsewhere in the community. Um, but we'd read a section of the uh, of the sedra, and then um, someone might offer uh, some words to open it up, some uh, a short summary or uh, Devar Torah. And then it would be open up for a conversation. Um, sometimes, um, I'm not sure if I'm confusing one community for another, but we would read until there was a question. You know, like, what does this mean? You know, and, and then go on and take off on that. Um, you know, that's kind of the closest I have to a recollection mm-hmm. of how that might have worked. But the conversations were always meaningful. Um, and certainly different than what any of us had ever experienced growing up in synagogues, you know, or temples, you know, where there was virtually no discussion, you know. And it was, by the way, the, the Fabrengen, you know, also inspired communities in the Washington, D.C. area to do uh, a lot of what, like the incorporation of music. Like I was invited, there was a rabbi in Potomac who 
visited Fabrengen. Somehow he got off on a Friday night and he came down. And he saw what was going on. He says, wow, we got to do this. So he brought me and the fiddler and the clarinetist to, to his congregation to basically model a Fabrengen service, you see. And then, uh, and then he also started having these open discussions. On this, you know, he would ask people, well, what does this mean to you? You know, unheard of in conservative synagogues. And this was in a conservative synagogue? Yeah, conservative synagogue. And they allowed instruments? On Friday nights. On Friday nights. And then, in a limited way, um, you know, it was the first conservative congregation, by the way, in the country, you know, to allow um, stringed instruments, okay? And uh, this is Harshal Lomond Potomac, okay? And, in fact, um, there's a mention in a book on Jewish music history uh, by Ron Isaacson, um, a graduate of the seminary, Jewish Theological Seminary. And he, uh, he, he has me as the first cantor, because I also have the title cantor, as uh, uh, introducing musical instrumentation, you know, into a conservative synagogue on Shabbat and the holidays. So it was, it was, it was fairly regular. I'm not sure what they're doing now. Uh, in those days, it was, it was more regular. More, uh, on Shabbat morning, I, probably less. Less so. Um, Shabbat afternoon for B'nai Mitzvah, yeah. Um, when, and I often was called in to lead services for a mincha uh, bar or bat mitzvah with music. Friday night, um, especially during Kabbalah Shabbat, you know, we, we did music. And yeah. at Verbrengen on Shabbat morning, were instruments used as well? Uh, I have less of a recollection of that because um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it was as accepted on mm -hmm. Shabbat morning. Um, I, I, I don't I don't remember I don't recall a discussion about it. Uh, it mm -hmm. I know if I wasn't there, it wasn't happening. So uh, that's maybe one of. Is the Is that reasons. true? I mean, there was no one else who sort of played guitar that could do the guitar. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. Not that I recall at that time. There were. There was there were a couple of violinists. Mm -hmm. um, there were other folks who played other yeah. instruments, but I'm not uh, I don't recall anyone else who played mm -hmm. guitar at the time. Yeah. We touched earlier on the the subject of gender, um, and you yeah. were saying that from the beginning it was an egalitarian service. Mm -hmm. Were you personally or as a community? to the extent of your knowledge, aware of the sort of growing movement towards Jewish feminism in the early 70s, Ezra Nashim was formed right in this yeah. period, 71, 72? I think we, yeah, we were, but we weren't impacted. I don't, I don't feel I was impacted by that. One of the reasons why I left the, uh, the conservative movement and the seminary and, and even and the consideration of, of studying there what had to do with with that that there wasn't that sense of uh, gender equality, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I left, and and also its lack of um, involvement in in the war in the in the war, in the anti-war movement and other social issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, it was too top down, and it was it was not a creative spiritual place. One of the things that several people have mentioned in, in regard to the um, partici participation and uh, roles of women in the early years of Fabrengen is that there was, in fact, a gender gap that had to do with knowledge, basic knowledge and skills, mm. because of the roles that women had played and grown up with and, yeah. and seen growing up, and that Fabrengen actually took steps through creating classes and other um, means for women to actually learn. Yeah. Do you remember that at all or any of the first times? So therefore, there, there were memorable occasions. The first time, I think it was Chava actually davened, led davening, um, and the first mm -hmm. time a woman actually laned. Not yeah. because there was negative attitudes towards it, but because women didn't have the skills yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memory of any any of those sort of sort of firsts for women within the Fabrengen community? Yeah, I have a memory. I have a memory of the first. I, uh, I do recall Chava's increasing involvement. Um, I don't recall um, specifically teaching a class to 
oh, sorry, class, teaching a class to anyone, <laughs> uh, to a, a group on that particular, uh, on davening, mm -hmm. um, or on liturgy, or on uh, chazanut. Do you remember I, I the beginnings of um, Benot Mitzvah, adult Benot Mitzvah? No, that was later. Um, in the seven, early 70s? Oh, Oh, Benot Mitzvah around the country? No, in Ferengen. Oh, Ferengen? Um, 73, I think. Was 70, the first. That was in, uh, I was in Israel. You were already so, gone. Yeah, I was yeah. gone by that, that was by your, that the point. year you were in Israel. Yeah, okay. no, I mm -hmm. think I heard about it. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I want to at least touch again on the, the issue of study and learning in the community, which also had a, a central role. What would you... Uh, how would you describe Fabrengan's vision for the role of learning within the community? Where was it in the sort of panoply of activities? Well, uh, during the period that I was there, uh, gosh, I mean, learning uh, was a central part of what we wanted to offer the community. So that's why we had array, an array of classes that we were offering. Um, and I don't remember the specific subjects of the of the different classes, but uh, it was central. We almost immediately got a study um, program, or a, I forget what we called it, the Institute for Jewish Studies. No, it wasn't called that. That's something else. Maybe it was. I, I forget. Um, I so. But uh, uh, the this, this study that was done and the discussions on Shabbat mornings were, were integral. It, we didn't have like a um, Chavrusa you know, study or... People getting together to have like you know more advanced study groups that that didn't happen at that time and I'm not sure if that happened later I don't think it ever really happened on that level. What was the style of teaching and learning at that point and the relationship mm -hmm. between teachers and learners? Uh, depended on the on the teacher you know and what the teacher was presenting on this particular style of teaching. Um, so it varied. I, there was no one particular style. Uh, teachers, um, so I'm trying to. Uh, people really often, me about, yeah, yeah, people often mention the Lairhouse as, uh, as Rosenzweig and Buber's mm -hmm. Lairhouse as the model. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that became, uh, yeah, that's like a later, another sta stage in what we started originally. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, that was an, an example. I mean, what's the, the model is basically the teachers not being paid, you know, um, for their just you know transmitting knowledge. So uh, those who taught at Fabrengen, um, the that formative year, um, some folks were paid, some were not. I mean, the person we brought in, I mentioned Mark Gilman. Um, he was salaried. Was uh, salaried. As I recall, yeah. Um, so others, I I don't remember the specific site. And this was mainly yeah. for the community, the Fabrengen community, or it was also open to others outside. Well, that at that time, the summer of '71, the Fabrengen community was pretty still emerging. Mm -hmm. you we're know. talking about '71, '72 as we're getting into. '72. I think it was always open, you know, to a, a larger group of people, you know, uh, you know the Fabrengen now, which is principally a membership organization, um, doesn't have, doesn't offer, uh, doesn't offer classes to the public. I mean, I mean, the Jewish Study Center, which comes out of Fabrengen, you know, does, and that is more along the Lairhouse uh, model, you know, that is, you know, Certainly, more along Matt Lair House. In what sense? No, that that their course is being open to the wider public, and that the teachers are giving of their time, you know, and um, so it's it's that kind of relationship. And mm -hmm. um, did you ever take classes? Actually, take classes at Fabrengen during that year? Take a class? No, I never took class. I, mm -hmm. you know, I know I gave a class, but I don't remember what it was in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, you know, I don't, I'd never take a class, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, part of it because I was coming with, uh, I guess, a body of knowledge that, you know, kind of is different than where other folks who were coming to us for the knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. 
So if we turn to social action uh, and activism um, in this period after after the first six months, mm -hmm. um, how did political activism sort of evolve during that period um, as a focus of community activity and concern? Well, it, I think it became diminished after the loss of funding. Mm -hmm. One of the members of Fabrengen, um, also a violinist or a violist, uh, he, uh, Ken Giles is his name. Ken Giles. Ken Giles. A um, uh, very active member in the community of that first year. He um, went off, and he was more political, and uh, started, his, started another coffee house. Um, and what was it called? Tzedek Tzedek, maybe? Tzedek Tzedek Coffee House, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I read about that. You read about it? All right. I mean, the name, I don't know the much name, more yeah, about it. So that was, you know, to meet a need that Fabrengen could no longer meet, you see? But inspired by J.U.J. and Fabrengen. And that, that was kind of maybe sort of combination. Because we used to have like a coffee house. But his coffee house is more like the J.U.J. coffee house, uh, which is called the... Jewish Urban Coffee House, or yeah, and JUJ's newspaper was called the Jewish Urban Guerrilla. Yes. Did you get? Did you read that? Mm -hmm. um, I should go back and read some of these. Yeah. Some so when Ken Giles started this Sedek Sedek Coffee mm -hmm. House, was it considered part of Fabrengen, or it was really an offshoot, essentially? I uh, I understand said it to be an offshoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and what role did sort of Israel and its role in, in uh, Jewish life play in Fabrengen in this period after, mm. after the funding? After the funding uh, was uh, taken, was denied yeah. us. Um, and the immediate aftermath, <laughs> not much as I recall. Um, now, others might have a different, you know, angle. It wasn't too long after uh, Fabrengen morphed into something else that Brera was founded, you know. And, 73, uh, I believe. 73, and um, that became a focus for those members of the former Jew, JUJ and Fabrengen uh, to, to become involved with. Um, and... Uh, you know, including myself, I was, I went to, I guess I was a, a member then. I was just looking to have a folder with some Bray Ra information here. So, uh, I mean, I wasn't at the center of, of Bray Ra, you know, but I was involved, but I was a member. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think many Fabrenganers or former Fabrenganers gravitated to Bray Ra at that point, and then later the New Jewish was Agenda. There a I don't know. I don't know exactly how it was organized. Was there a chapter or a center of activity in the Washington D.C. area for Brera? There was. Uh, yeah, I. I don't remember going to its meetings. I went to conferences, but not to. I don't think to a specific Brera meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and again, in seventy three, seventy four, I was out of the country, right. and then I took off for Iowa. There's no Brera chapter in Iowa. No. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but I didn't. It didn't have. So you're saying yeah. that Bray Ross sort of. That's where people put their energy. If if that they were interested in those kinds of activities. Yeah, it was not in the Fabrengen and Chavura. You know, right. the Fabrengen Chavura was that was not as I recall, and even till this very day, you know, is not a focus. You know, it's not right. a it's not a focus. Um. Okay, I want to talk about one more thing and then we'll take yeah. a break and that is the uh, issue of retreats yeah. okay so we've talked about kfar out mm -hmm. um but uh weiss's farm was also a retreat site center. where retreats took place mm -hmm. um were you involved in those retreats at weiss's farm not terribly i went to one or two i do remember weiss's farm because i used to uh, I didn't live that far from Weiss Farm. I lived in New Jersey, you know, and then um, 
there were other occasions, maybe Atid. Atid had a, uh, a retreat there once or twice. So I was familiar with Weiss's farm as a place. Um, I went to maybe two Chavura retreats uh, over the years. I was more involved, and that and Weiss's farm really that retreat was um, was sponsored, I guess, by the Chavura Institute. You know, the National Chavura Institute, which emerged much later. You say in the late seventies. In the late seventies. So the ones so, that you're saying that you went to retreats in the later seventies, but uh, not not in the first. No. Few years. I think they might have started actually just when you were leaving. It could. Uh, uh, Fabrengen went there as Fabrengen, or Fabrengen, Fabrengen New York Chavara and and Chavara Shalom. Okay, so that's before that did, the Chavara Institute. That did three, yeah. uh, three retreats a year. Okay, so so that's probably how the Chavara Institute emerged. Was probably out of those retreats and the yes. coming together yeah. of the different Chavara. Yeah. I. Yeah, I don't recall going to those retreats, uh, maybe one, maybe one of those retreats and a later Chavara Institute retreat. Mm -hmm. As I say, uh, I think they were getting going really as you were yeah, as I was, as leaving as for leaving. Israel. Yeah, I think okay. that's right. Um, yeah, that's probably okay. right. So we're back from our break and before we move on, you wanted to tell us about this uh, garment. So at Fabrengen, <clears throat> Uh, in the early days, we uh, uh, designed our own uh, four-cornered uh, garments, the stashiki, as you can see. Uh, and it was uh, designed, actually, by one of our um, members, I guess, uh, Adriana. And, uh, and the, uh, we, haven't, we didn't attach at the time. There were several that she made. Um, this is the only one, I think, that, that, that I have. Um, and we attached uh, tzitzit to the four corners. And the idea was that those who wanted in Fabrengen to have to wear this garb uh, could do so. No one, uh, you know, no one actually uh, wore this garb, you know, uh, well, a little bit. I, I wore this a little bit, but I don't think I wore it out in the streets. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Arthur Wasco uh, did. Uh, he, uh, he continues to wear four-cornered um, Dashiki, and I um, believe that it was inspired by, by what we were trying to create at Fabrengen in those days. Um, yeah, and the idea of you know being you know kind of uh, multicolored. It was later that Zalman, Zalman Shachter Shlomi, uh, uh, blessed memory, uh, created the um, the rainbow talit, right. and um, and so. So that idea was floating around, you know, the, you know that, and the kind of also, I, we didn't mention before, the kind of bridge work that Fabrengen was doing in, in uh, D.C., DuPont Circle with um, other communities, uh, principally the black community that was uh, just a few blocks away. And uh, I don't remember, you know, much in the way of specifics. Uh, we didn't do uh, particular projects or actions together, but... Uh, there was uh, there was a relationship, and it was you know, important for us to have relationships with with those in our in our community in the Dupont Circle area community. So your turn. <laughs> <laughs> so we're now going to turn to the concluding uh, section of our conversation, and I'd like to focus on your thoughts about how this period of intense involvement with Fabrengen. This, this very early period in Fabrengen's life um, affected your own life moving forward and things that you got involved with and things that you became involved in founding and nurturing mm -hmm. and also your reflections on the broader impact of mm -hmm. the Chavara on American Jewish life. So just to wow. move us forward, mm -hmm. you spent the year 73-74 in Israel um, both in Jerusalem and on kibbutz. Yeah. Not, not the entire year, most of the year. I, I left for Israel the summer of 70, August of 73, and came back uh, a, toward the end of April in um, 74. And uh, um, Israel, it was quite the first time I was there. Uh, I lived on a kibbutz and found myself in the, in the Yom Kippur War. Because uh, I was on kibbutz in October, October 6. And a kibbutz that was also bombed, so um, so that was quite it's kibbutz uh, Yifat. Kibbutz, kibbutz Yifat, you know, in the Emek uh, Israel. And um, so that that year was uh, tremendous, uh, 
powerful experience. Why did uh, you decide to I, go to Israel at that point? I, one, I, I had never been. Two, uh, I felt um, I needed to um, get away, you know, from everything I was doing here as an opportunity to also reflect and, and to try to figure out what my next steps would be. Um, it was an opportunity to, to learn. I wanted to learn Hebrew. I immersed myself in an um, Opan in Jerusalem for a, for a month or so. And mm, Beit HaNoar. Beit HaNoar. Yeah. How would you know all this? <laughs> um, Beit HaNoar. And um, I, I ordered a class with uh, um, a David Hartman um, at the Hebrew University and became a little familiar with, uh, with his teachings. And, um, yeah, uh, it was a fabulous, uh, fabulous year, very intense. I came back not knowing what I wanted to do and uh, um, re-met an old friend named Ira Cohen. Um, <clears throat> and uh, moved, he had a group house and I moved in there with him and, and he was exploring the idea of creating a, a kosher kitchen modeled after a community kosher, uh, restaurant uh, that he visited in Romania. But he wanted to create a, a kosher kitchen here that would also serve the community and also um, be run collectively and in a not only non-profit way but in an anti-profit way that we wanted to also be a center for, for, for teaching, for conveying um, also social values to the larger Jewish community and engaging the Jewish community in communicating more in, with each other, but also in uh, uh, being concerned about what's going, what was going on in the rest of society. And um, so uh, we, um, uh, I, I, he didn't know if the project was going to get off the ground, but it was a very exciting concept. Uh, it sounded in some ways like the original Fabrengen concept, because we also had, Rob and I had spoken about a a kosher restaurant, um, and but it didn't look like he was going to get off the ground. So I and I was looking to do something, and I also not to live in the Washington D.C. area. I needed a, a quieter place. So I asked Max Tickton, who was the associate Hillel director at the time. Uh, I asked him if there's a place in this country I could go where it's quiet, where I can do something for the Jewish community. Is there a Hillel position out there? And he said, Ah, I have the place for you, Iowa, Central Iowa. Uh, there's, uh, there's a Jewish student center there. They don't have a full-time, they're looking for a full-time Hillel director to serve the students at Drake University and to do outreach to Grinnell College and to uh, uh, the Iowa State in Ames, Iowa. And I said, that sounds perfect, that sounds perfect. So I, that summer, went out to, um, to start the position in, at Drake University. Um, and while I uh, was out there, had the experience of, of creating a chavura essentially for the students um, because our Jewish Student Center started to feel more and more like what Fabrengen uh, felt like and that felt really good. Um, we also, I also created uh, uh, Jewish, study, uh, Jewish classes in, in Jewish studies uh, for the uh, university as part of an experimental college they called New College, you know, where you know, people who wanted to offer courses could offer courses. And uh, for credit, so I so I was able to teach one or two classes for like one credit, you know, and um, so that worked out nicely. And uh, so it was a great it was a great year out there. And then in the middle of that year, I learned that the Kosher Kitchen Collective was getting off the ground, and it was really happening. They got some uh, funding, and uh, they got got a place. And so I said, well, this sounds like I need to get back. So um, that following summer, after the school uh, term, I came back and um, uh, got re-engaged in some of the other work that I was doing, with, mainly with the band, uh, with the Ferenga Fiddlers, uh, and, um, and started working with the Kosher Kitchen Collective. And I moved into uh, the house um, uh, of the Kosher Kitchen. The house, it housed 11, of the, 11 members of the collective. Uh, and, uh, and again, it was like, Wow, this is great! It was like a, it was actually a deeper for me, a deeper sense of uh, fellowship and and chavura, um, and it was felt extremely holistic because 
part of the concept that Rob had, and which I, I really liked a lot, was the concept of a more holistic community that was integrating the, you know, spirituality with uh, responsiveness to social issues, with earning a livelihood, uh, with a connection to the country, you know, and, and the kosher kitchen, you know, um, felt like that vision. So I, uh, I got involved, and I, I wasn't such a great cook. Um, so I had other jobs in the kitchen, and it was run collectively. It was workers self-managed. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, it was not important for us to make money. That was not the issue. The importance was to create um, uh, a change, you know, and to to influence the quality of life, Jewish life, and also to build relationships with other collectives in the Washington area. We were part of the Food Federation, it was called, the Greater Washington Area. Other collectives and groups that were doing alternative uh, work in the, in, the, in the food world. So all, you know, so here we are connected to the Jewish counterculture, but also connected to the larger um, counterculture alternative movements. And it felt great. Um, we got heavily involved in the, uh, the grape boycott in the, in the United Farmers Workers, uh, Farm Workers Movement at the time uh, as well. So uh, that emerged out of that. And that, that, that uh, the kitchen, you know, worked out for, for three years, then things changed. Uh, people, you know, other needs that arose, and 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 and, and so it kind of, um, and in fact, the the connection with Fabrengo is actually pretty strong. The founder of the Kosher Kitchen, or one of the founders of the Kosher Kitchen Collective, in the third year of the Kosher Kitchen, became also the part-time coordinator for the Fabrengo Who is that? community. Ira Cohen. Uh, now he, his name is Ira Karim. He uh, he made Aliyah. Um, not that long after the kosher kitchen uh, dissolved, um, the restaurant itself dissolved. The collective still meets periodically, and we just had a meeting uh, recently. The, the the kosher kitchen collective formally dissolved in seventy nine. Uh, seventy eight ish, seventy. Yeah, we turned the restaurant over to uh, someone else in mm -hmm. seventy nine. I guess seven. Mm -hmm. You yeah. you had referred to the Kosher Kitchen Collective as an urban kibbutz. Right. Yeah, well, we, um, many of us uh, grew up uh, in Habonim, all right? So, and many of the members of the collective, several not, I wouldn't say more than half, but several had gone to Camp Moshava, which is the Habonim Duror uh, uh, camp here in Maryland. Um, I, as a kid living on the farm, I was a member of uh, Habonim, you know, youth group, you know, in uh, in, uh, in 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 Jackson Township, uh, um, New Jersey. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was a kibbutz in the sense that we were uh, living together, we were sharing income together, we were working. I mean, everything as you would find on a traditional kibbutz, excuse me, traditional kibbutz, except that we were in the city um, and living in a house that ultimately became the Woodside Synagogue. The, uh, we lived in an old farmhouse that um, we left and it was then renovated and in addition added on to it became an Orthodox synagogue after we left it. We sanctified it uh, for the Orthodox community. And our restaurant, you know, was uh, doing tremendous uh, bridge work in the Jewish community. It's the only place in town where you know, Orthodox Jews could come, and also secular Jews. And it was a great meeting place, and we had a coffee house there, and we offered classes there. We did folk dancing. We, um, we gave tours to Hebrew school groups, and we talked about the, the great boycott. You know, we, we interwove the politics into, and the whole thing about, you know, here we were, basically, kibbutz, I mean, this is, we're talking about socialism. You know, and we were, you know, kind of sharing these values with the people who came to the restaurant. And of course, you know, some people in the, in the community were kind of rubbed a little bit by, you know, by this. Um, but most people, I think, really appreciated that this was the only kosher restaurant in the Washington, D.C. area. A hundred seats. We were able to seat a hundred people and uh, providing this kind of service. We also did a Meals on Wheels program to elderly shut-ins. We, we brought kosher food and had visits with elderly shut-ins. So it was a magnificent, uh, magnificent uh, program. And... Kind of for me, it was the you know it was the fulfillment of what, for me, a, a, a holistic community or 
you know, in, in our vision, uh, Chavura, you know, could be, you know, in its deepest and highest sense. We weren't a davening community because on Shabbat we'd each go our different ways. Uh, some of the members of the collective went to a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist study group, and others of us, you know, davened. You know, so, so yeah. it's that kind of thing. Um, so, um, so throughout the 70s, as we were just saying, the, the uh, mm -hmm. Kosher Kitchen Collective was something you were engaged in. You also were developing uh, these arts collectives. Uh, tell us briefly um, about the Jewish Folk Arts Festival that actually okay. yeah. took place in 77. So one of the, <sighs> one of the pieces that emerged, emerged from the original Fabrengen was this, were the, this emphasis on the arts. Uh, and it was uh, very um, important for me and for, and for others as people realized the significant, the lack of, of arts in the Jewish community, lack of creative arts. Um, it, um, this is also during the time that uh, May Rockland, do you know the name? May Rockland. Right? Jewish, Jewish, uh, Jewish Yellow Pages. Jewish Yellow Pages, right. And her focus on the arts. Um, uh, another philosopher, Jewish thinker that deeply influenced me going back to high school was, of course, Mordechai Kaplan, mm -hmm. you know, who understood Judaism as a, as a civilization. And that always resonated with me that, you know, we have music, we have the arts. But uh, there was a um, kind of a, a, a hiatus, I guess, of, of creativity in the Jewish community in the realm of the arts. And with the world of folk arts, you know, and people's arts emerging in the larger culture in the, especially in the late 60s, and the emergence of the Smithsonian Folk Life Festivals and, and bringing together from, you know, kind of revealing the arts of different groups came to the forefront. Well, I mean, this was, what about us? You know, where are we? So, uh, so a few of us created the Jewish Folk Arts Society. Um, Stu Kopans and I and Surum I mentioned uh, before, and um, and it was kind of was sitting around you know there for a couple of years, and then we started organizing the Jewish Folk Arts Festival, which took place at American University in D.C. The very first folk arts. We gathered around whoever was engaged in the arts, and uh, musically and also the visual. Uh, Locally in the Greater Washington. Greater area. Washington area, and we held this initial festival. Uh, that, that was 1977, and it was sponsored by Fabrengen, the Jewish Folk Arts Society, and the Kosher Kitchen Collective. All right? So you have these uh, three, and the uh, Folk Arts Society was, wasn't really, wasn't a, it was more like a collective than it wasn't a Chavura as such. Um, we didn't consider ourselves a Chavura. And we had this festival, and, and, uh, and then um, as the Jewish Folk Arts Society became um, more known, I guess, and we developed a membership body. We were able to rent space in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, and start developing other festivals. And so the first festival drew maybe 300 people, the second festival, 1,000 people. We rented the Silver Spring Armory, you know, and it kind of grew from there. And for uh, more, than a, more than a decade, ran these annual festivals that grew in number an impact on the greater Washington, D.C. community. Because we're, you know, basically uh, reviving. It was a revivalist effort, you know, to develop and encourage Jewish expression through the arts. And so it had a major impact on Jewish, uh, Jewish life. Um, uh, what can I say, you know... Um, and it's still going to this day, the festival. Uh, well, yeah, the last, uh, the last full festival we had, what happened is it, it stopped. The Folk Arts Society... Um, I left it, and partly to to uh, kind of have a family, right? So turned it over to some of the other uh, organize other people who are organizing uh, in the folk art society, and um, and and it went on for a few years, and then it fizzled uh, and because of lack of funding, because of lack of whatever, and it fizzled. So for ten years there wasn't a folk arts festival, and. Um, uh, what happened, they, uh, what, what was left of the Jewish Folk Art Society was then um, taken under the umbrella of Am Kolel. In 1990, uh, after my kids were a little bit older and I had a little more time, um, I started another organization, uh, another community. 
And I actually modeled the community in many ways on the original vision of the Fabrengen, okay, to create a, um, a community and out, to do outreach and to try to create a more responsive and holistic Jewish community. So, um, uh, so the Folk Arts Society, the arts piece, came under our umbrella. We didn't do anything with it immediately. Um, and, 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 and then we started meeting these unmet needs in the community. People would come to me and say, listen, we'd like to do this, we'd like to do that. You know, we're not into davening. We're not, some people, oh, we'd like something more spiritual. We don't like going to synagogues. We don't do synagogues and temple, organized religion, too expensive, whatever. So, uh, so we st I started identifying these different needs and created this umbrella for, to meet these different needs. And I was able to, uh, just from, get some funding from, uh, uh, from a couple of individuals, not much. Most of the funding came from uh, revenues from high holiday services, okay? And how did that happen? Uh, the community, in 1978, um, I was asked to help a group of people, eight families, to create a chavura for them in 1978. And uh, I had known them from different places, and, uh, uh, and, and, and I said, okay, let's, uh, I'll work with you for a year, help you get off the ground. Uh, 38 years later, I'm still with the community, okay? So they created a Chavura, fellowship community, member-directed, um, and with only limited membership each year, if only five new families, uh, five new households could come in because they want to integrate. Every family coming had to take responsibility. It was not a Davani community um, celebrating holidays, absolutely. We met twice a month on Friday nights. The Sunday morning education programs for the kids was really essential, and the adult education <coughs> program, very essential. And uh, so we, we, uh, we, we formed this Chavura. They asked Which was me, called? I'm um, sorry, Kihila Chadasha. We didn't know what to call it, so we called it Kihila Chadasha, which means a new community. Um, Kihila Chadasha, and we um, started meeting people's homes and in uh, renting space in, in schools. Uh, and the community is now 100 households. 100 households, and, uh, and very, very, very active. And over the years, it's gotten increasingly active in... Uh, social and political issues as well. Um, so that is, uh, uh, so the connection between the Kehila Chadasha and Am Kolel. So here, so Kehila Chadasha, when I said, I'll stay with you, I'll stay with this community. If you do the logistics for the high holidays and open the high holiday services to anyone who wants to come, all right? So this small community of, at that time, a couple dozen families organized, uh, the, did the logistics for the high holidays. Um, and there were a couple hundred or so people came the first year. Uh, then we rented a high school. And um, within a few years, there were 1,400 people coming to high holiday services. Okay, not people all at the same pay time. pay for services or not? What? They, they, they buy tickets? Or yeah, so they so would, oh, there was a suggested donation for tickets. People pay for tickets. Mm -hmm. So after, uh, you know, so I said to the Chavura, I said, okay. And then people were coming to me from, they said, wow, we love the high holiday service, but we'd like to do something during the year too. But we don't want to do like a chavara. We don't want to like, you know, we want to be involved, but not too involved. You know that kind of thing. Um, so we, uh, so I said to the kehila chadasha people, um, I said, well, how about if um, you have all this revenues coming in? So let's let's um, split the revenues, you know, and 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 basically, or give me a grant, you know, for uh, essentially it turned out to be like a grant to create other. Um, this other institution, this other community, you know, or other, or other communities, which led to the creation of Am Kalel, okay? Led to the creation of Am Kalel, and it's basically, uh, so, so that, that, you know, because I don't, I, don't, I don't get paid a salary from Am Kalel. I get this, what I, what I identify call it like as a grant, okay? Um, and uh, to do the work that I do in the, in the larger community, so it helped me to create Am Kalel. And then under Amkolel, we've created and incubated other, other, other groups under Amkolel, trying again to create this holistic community. So under Amkolel, we have, we created Jews United for Justice. Okay, we incubated that organization, now has over a thousand members here in the greater Washington, D.C. area and Baltimore. Um, that was created, maybe it's 15 years ago, uh, 14 years ago. Uh, I came out of a, um, a class that I was teaching on Heschel and social action as part of the Jewish Study Center. 
See the connections? Amazing connections, okay? I was teaching a, a class, basically it was a two or three week session, or I forget. It was Seshel's yard site at the time. Uh, so, so a couple people came, out to, out, out, came to me after that meeting and said, listen, is there anything happening here in town um, where Jews can do social and political action as Jews? I said, no, there used to be. It used to be called Jews for Urban Justice. They said, really? What happened to that group? So I went into the whole story. And um, I said, well, listen, let's, uh, let's, let's get together. So we, we, we met uh, at, at, a, at a restaurant and we talked more about it. And then we had another organizing meeting at a bookstore called Politics and Prose. The owner was originally a member of Jews for Urban Justice. And, um, and we invited some former members from Jews for Urban Justice. Uh, Mike Tabor, have you heard his name? Yes. Okay. So Mike Tabor came to that meeting, a couple other people, and a couple so of... Is Avi Rosenblatt involved in this at all? Who? who? Avi, Avi Rosenblatt? <laughs> Know the name, but he was not not in this. In this not not uh, at the stage. The stage, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and we sat around, talked about the vision, talked about Jews for Urban Justice, what it did, and uh, created and gave it the name Jews United for Justice. And so Am Kolel incubated that group, new group, for three years until they got their own five hundred one c three, and they got and they got funding from other sources. What is what do you mean by incubate? By incubate, incubate. So. Um, uh, incubate is basically to take an, a, 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 a seedling, okay, under uh, people with this, individuals with a vision for something they want to do in the community, under our umbrella. Um, we would serve as their fiscal sponsor, and uh, which would allow them to apply for grants, and we'd also help them with their administration. We do the bookkeeping for them, take care of the accounting. You see. Mm -hmm. So we've done that with a number of organizations under the Am Kalel umbrella um, over the over the years, and, um, and 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 these groups are you know we are connected, but it's not like um, we're creating a community within a community. You see, uh, it was part of the vision that Martin Buber actually had for creating creating community. It's the wind outside, um, or Martin Buber showing up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so it's that kind of concept, and um, the Jewish Folk Arts Festival was resurrected under also under that umbrella. It's a it's a community. Why it's a committee from the community that plans it, but it's under uh, the umbrella of the Jewish Folk Arts uh, Festival. No, no, there's no longer a Jewish Folk Arts Society, but the Jewish Folk Arts Festival is under our umbrella. Um, we, uh, you know, and it's you know. It, it, yeah, and that we had one last year, where because the energy is not there to keep it going, it's a tremendous amount of energy. We're we're changing the concept. Uh, we're actually going to be doing focused festivals under the umbrella of the Jewish Folk Arts Festival, which is under Am Kolel. Um, we're doing a Yiddish Writers Festival this coming March, so it's an aspect of the Jewish Folk Arts Festival. We'll be focusing in on. It'll be a lot easier to focus in. So every year we'll do a different focus. Because it's too much to do. Because the Folk Arts Festival included exhibits of artists and craftspeople. Uh, it included performances on several stages and included some twenty or more workshops. Yeah. It was, uh, and also food. It was yeah. like an amazing operation. So, and we, and I had hired you know people to help coordinate it. Um, so that's, uh, so that's, so also I'm Kolel also under the umbrella is the country connection, which we never could get off the ground. When Fabrengen, at one point Fabrengen and the Jewish Folk Arts Society and, and um, the Kosher Kitchen uh, decided to p kind of pull their resources and find a place in the country, okay? To have a retreat center, coming back to the Kfara idea, I'll talk about that later, to, uh, to run a camp for kids, mm -hmm. to inculcate you know, those values that we cherish. You see, and kind of a uh, like a Jewish counterculture kind of camp. You see, so that so we went out in 1977. We went out looking for a place. This is when, uh, or 70 maybe 78. Um, we couldn't find we couldn't find a place. But under Am Kolel, um, uh, 12 years ago, this place kind of just dropped in our laps. You know, it's uh, 30 minutes from here. Beautiful retreat center. And, uh, and it serves not only the Jewish community, um, but also 
other communities, religious communities and social justice groups and whatever. So we have that under the umbrella. We also run a summer program. So this is, that, that's the Sanctuary Retreat? That's the Sanctuary Retreat, Retreat Center. And Renewal Center. Yeah. And Renewal Center, which is under the Amkulel umbrella. We also have a Chavara under the Amkulel umbrella, that, umbrella mm -hmm. that is the more spiritual um, Chavara that meets uh, regularly on Shabbat mornings for our davening. And our davening is very similar to the, dav to the dav davening in many other chavurot and renewal communities. It's kind of a cross between e traditional egalitarian and, um, and West Coast renewal. All right. Can you say a few words about renewal? And in the, and in the interim, you've also been called a Judaist. You have your cantor. Uh, you became a rabbi. Right. right. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, so... <sighs> Um, all right, so I needed, um, you know, I didn't have a title in the community, but I studied with cantors ever since I was a kid. And through um, apprenticeship, essentially, through apprenticeship, I became um, uh, a cantor. And, uh, and that, in fact, that was the traditional way of doing it. I also studied with two of the founders of the Cantors Instit Institute at the Jewish Theological Seminary. So I had wonderful, wonderful teachers and a really good background in cantorial liturgical studies. Um, and uh, so when the Kehillah community um, started, you know, they wanted to, when they decided they wanted me to serve as their spiritual leader, um, the title that, that we chose was, cant was Cantor. Okay? I didn't want to be called Rabbi, first of all. That, that was a loaded term, and I was so kind of not anti-rabbi, but wanted to be part of a Judaism that wasn't focused or emanating from rabbis. You see, it wasn't like a top-down, most synagogues and temples. You know, it's kind of a pyramid kind of structure. You have the rabbi, you know, kind of there determining kind of the, uh, the way a community uh, lives, and not only the parent body, and also the opposition to parent bodies was something that I really had a very hard time with. So I didn't want the title rabbi. Um, cantors are more of the people, okay? So that was okay. That felt fine. You know, and then the word Judaist, I picked up from Mordechai Kaplan, because he used the word Judaist as a knowledgeable Jew, you know, who, uh, and a, who was an advocate for Judaism, you know, and uh, that, kind of, that kind of sense. So I liked that term, and I had no problem calling myself a Judaist. So I was hired as a Judaist cantor, you know, for, or a cantor Judaist, you know, in my... Uh, in the Kehila Chadasha community. Um, we started, uh, years ago, um, uh, start, we started a seminary here, actually, called Ma'alot, a seminary for cantors and Judaeus. Okay, training cantors and Judaeus uh, in Jewish music, liturgy, and the ceremonial arts. So, um, and that was principally to serve a need um, in the growing movement of independent congregations in Chavarot here in the Washington area. There are now uh, there were then, now, I don't know, 12 to 15 independent communities. And I was serving three of them. I was also serving a, a uh, sort of a Chavara community. It's a member-directed community in, uh, called Shorashim, which means roots, in Northern Virginia. And for 20 years, I would lead services once, once a month out, once up out there for them and also serve as a Judaic resource person or Judaist for them as well. So... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so we decided to create this seminary, and Max Tickner was on the faculty, Sue Romer, you know, a lot of Chavara people. A couple of non-Chavara people, Bob Sachs, who was a Hillel director, um, Mindy Portnoy, other, other, other people became part of our faculty, and from Orthodox to, to Reform. Okay, and it was a wonderful program for a number of years, and we did a lot of educate, education in the community, to the Chavarot and independent communities, but also to uh, synagogues and temples that were looking for uh, more background. I was invited to uh, synagogues to teach members how to read Torah, so they can have, you know, different people could read Torah, not just the cantor or just the rabbi. You see, um, taught people how to play music for their services. They had people, this is becoming more popular, especially in non-conservative, certainly non-Orthodox, uh, in Reconstructionists and other uh, communities sure. to help mm. teach their musicians. So this, uh, so this project was called Ma'alot, and um, actually Ma'alot 
because we didn't have enough funding to keep the administration going, uh, and we had to make a choice. Either we buy the retreat center or we keep Malot. So we decided, okay, Malot's going to be on hold. We're going to go for the retreat center because this is like a, a dream. I mean, ever since Kfar out in 1971, Kfar out, um, the re, this sort of retreat center that uh, George Johnson from Fabrengen and, and I rented that summer, um, you know, I had this dream to, to find another place like that. And part of the dream had to do with my, get my own personal need to get back to the country, growing up uh, in, on a farm. So um, <clears throat> what else? Under, so that's Amkulel, you know, which is in many ways uh, trying to um, fulfill that vision that, that Rob, you know, and, and that I also very much bought into so deeply uh, in those formative years of, uh, of, of Fabrengen. And to create, you know, again, you know, chavu, the idea of, of, of helping people create Chavurot. Uh, what would you see as the greatest challenges that the early Chavurot faced? Oh, gosh, the early Chavurot? I, one of the challenges has to do with um, viability. Um, if you don't have, uh, ch- you know, children to educate, if, you know, most Chavurot didn't have schools <coughs> for their children. Uh, the Kila Chadasha always had had a children. Fabrengen also had, there were children there, and over the years Fabrengen had different kinds of programming for children. Um, but it was the need to educate children that 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 that, that made it possible, um, that made the Fabrengen Cheder possible, because that became focused more on the kids. Um, so one of the challenges is uh, is is renewing itself not only um, by bringing in new members, but also by um, you know, meeting the needs of the members. So if there are members who have families and those needs are not being met, then they're going to go someplace else. Um, if uh, for young people, uh, the traditional chavurot, as the traditional chavurot, as people aged, you know, it became, I think, more difficult to attract you know, younger, younger people. Uh, the Fabrengen community is an aging community. Amkolel is an aging community. Kihil Chadasha is a renewable community because uh, there's a much, uh, much, much greater effort to to make itself attractive to younger younger families through just greater efforts at networking and and we've been able to do that. We're we're in a revival mode kind of right right now, which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, on the high holidays, we have youth services, which also has made it possible for us to bring in younger families. So, so that's part of it. Uh, uh, is there another aspect to the question? Um, what I wanted to ask you, um, what, as you look back over this past half century, so from the early Chavarot through the developments that have happened since then, what we call the Chavarot movement, but also other things that we've been talking about, um, what do you see as the impact of the first independent Chavarot on Jewish life? Oh, first of all, I think it's a tremendous impact, okay? Because um, the, uh, the Chavarot, I think, inspired or awakened the established Jewish community, the mainstream Jewish community, um, and their leadership uh, to um, try to be more responsive to the needs of their own members and... Uh, and also those who they'd like to attract. So the more successful uh, chavurot, uh, uh, synagogues, I think, um, certainly here in the Washington area, are those that have recognized um, the, the importance of creating fellowship communities or uh, chavurot under their umbrella. So, uh, and it's been a challenge for many congregations. Really, you have to be a congregation of a certain size to do it without diluting, you know, your your davening, you know, uh, regular davening. Um, in fact, when I when I joined the staff at Har Shalom, this is the congregation that they brought in music for the first time. Part of my job as the Jewish Environment Program Environmentalist—that was my title, Jewish Program Environmentalist—was <laughs> <laughs> to create chavurot within the congregation. Okay, and I started doing that, and it was it was it was working, you know, until the uh, the educator of the school of seven hundred and some some odd kids 
got ill and he couldn't run the school, so they asked me to run the school um, with the with with his assistant, with his secretary, and uh, so I, I couldn't continue doing that. Um, uh, uh, Addis Israel, conservative synagogue here in town, um, has had for years, you know, a wonderful chavurot under its umbrella, and now has a wellness and meditation center. Maybe you know a little bit about it. And so they've taken many ideas that have come out of the chavura movement and also out of Jewish renewal, and they're uh, trying to apply these ideas to their own institutions. And 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 they're you know they're they're I think they're pretty successful. The uh, other other congregations are you know other conservative congregations and some reform congregations have done the same. Not so familiar with the reform movement and the Reconstructionists, you know, uh, movement has always been there always been a close affinity with the Chavura uh, movement. Um, you know, with Art Green and, and uh, for a short time uh, Art Waskow uh, being on the faculty there and. Uh, what, yeah. What's the relationship, if any, that you see between um, Chavurot and groups that call themselves independent Minyanim and explicitly not Chavurot today? The relationship or the... Yeah, or the, and the, yeah. Well, I think there, gosh, there are some independent <laughs> Minyanim which I think are more like Chavurot because um, people have relationships that uh, also... Or beyond just the davening. I mean, a chavur, is a chavura, you know, a chavura if it's only davening, you know, if it's only for davening, is it a chavura? Um, is it a fellowship? I mean, if um, you know, if you're only in, in in relationship with that person or persons, you know, once a week, like at kiddush, you know, does that make you a chavura? You know, it makes you a davening community, but does it make you a chavura? And my my feeling is no, it doesn't. Oh, that's so you're not, saying that most most independent minyanim are in fact davening communities. Most independent minyanim are okay davening communities, but does that make them a chavura? Right. Okay. If that's the only aspect of life that they're engaged in, I don't think they're a chavura. For me, uh, in my understanding of a chavura, is that there there's much more going on. There's not only is there the sharing of, of life cycle events, birth through death, you know, being supportive of each other, um, having meals together in people's homes, going out together, you know, doing social service, community service projects together, um, when necessary, marching together. Um, it's kind of a full life press. You know, it's uh, for me the concept of a chavura is more is is a, it's a more holistic concept, um, and but I know for other under independent chavura it's not necessarily that way. You know, so um, I I'd, I'd have to ask I ha, I've not been in association with members of other chavura outside the Washington area in a long time. The last time I went to a Chavra Institute was, I think, five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping to go maybe this summer uh, again. Uh, and uh, different Chavra meet different needs for their members. Uh, the Chavra Kila Chadasha is not a davening community, but it has all the, these other aspects, the learning, life celebrations, community service, um, responsiveness to what's going on in society, uh, you know, it's like, you know, br doing bridge work with other communities, inviting Muslims to Pesach Seders, and you know what I mean? Yes. That's that for me is um, you know is a fuller concept of a of chavura. If it's only for davening, it can be called a davening chavura. Yeah. But it's but it's not what I think is uh, the fuller concept of a chavura. So finally. Yeah. Um, as well, sort of the challenges of the 21st century for the Jewish community comes into a sharper view, um, what do you see as the future for Chavarot? Hmm. That's a... Uh, the future, if it's being informed by the past, uh, it, of, of independent Chavarot, um, it's mixed. 
there's a tremendous uh, need um, for people to gather. Uh, you know, more than 50%, it's probably more like 60, 70% of the Jewish community is not affiliated, okay? In the greater Washington area, it's like 64, 67% of the Jewish community is not affiliated with, you know, with the Jewish institutions. Um, you know, so I have discovered through my work that there are a lot of people out there who want to be connected, but they're not going to go to synagogues and temples. They're not into organized religion. They have great doubts about the, um, about the value of traditional religious, what, how they have been exposed to it. Um, they, uh, they, they, they want to be connected, many, many Jews in some way, but um, there aren't the kinds of institutions, or well, maybe Jewish community centers can better serve that purpose, and some are starting to do that. Uh, uh, some are starting to do that. I, uh, what, what we need, I think we need to create uh, more Judaic resource centers around the country. You know, like Fabrenga essentially was a, it was a, a Jewish resource center. Um, it was an outreach center initially, with the vision of, of creating a chavurot, of, of having, these, uh, having this kind of community. Um, if we create Judaic resource centers around the country, uh, Jewish renewal centers, you know, that is staffed, with the purpose of helping people who are not connected to come together, uh, kind of like Lubavitch Light, okay? Lubavitch does a tremendous job, you know, in reaching out to people. I have great respect for Lubavitch and, and how they've been able to organize in, in Pucón, Chile, in a nothing, nothing town, in Pucón, Chile, in the mountains, in the Andes. There is, there's Lubavitch. You know, so they have this ability to, to do outreach and to bring people in, help people feel good, even though they're coming from this orthodox framework. If, um, if we could do that, you know, create these kinds of Jewish or Judaic resource centers that are there for the purpose of meeting people's needs and help them meet, meet those needs, either spiritually or through social action or through the arts or through connecting with uh, a fabulous historical tradition. I, um, I think that's the way to go. That's the future of Chavarot. Creating these centers that then would spawn Chavarot, have a hub, it's the Fabrengan model, the original. This is Rob Agus, and and I must a shout out to Rob Agus because I loved working with him. Okay, and um, and uh, I mean, what can I say? I mean, that vision is is I think the vision that needs to be perpetuated, or or developed more. But it takes tremendous resources, I think, uh, to do it. Uh, I was lucky because I had a, this other community, the Chavura, that does the logistics on the high holidays, that provides the income for me to help other people get together. And uh, that's, uh, you know, I don't know how that can be replicated easily. But that's what I think, uh, you know, the idea of being, living in community and being in fellowship, you know, is at the core of how Jewish life can survive, you know, in, uh, in the coming decades. Without community, you know, we can't, we can't survive without relationships, real serious relationships between um, individuals and communities, we're not going to survive. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, Jane, for the, Wonderful and all your supporters and really everyone for this, Michael, everyone for this project. This is a Eitz Chaim He. It, she is a tree of life for those... Start that intro one more time. Oh, uh, it's called Eitz Chaim He. And uh, Arthur Wasco asked me to write a song for a tree planting ceremony. It was called the Trees for Vietnam Campaign, a tree planted on the Capitol grounds, 1971, I think it was, um, during that uh, first year of Fabrengen. And uh, so I put this melody to its claim, a tree, it is a tree of life for those who hold on to it, it is a tree of life for peace. And um, it's all part of, you know, winding down the Vietnam War.
and it became um, regularly used at Fabringen and in our community, other communities um, over the years. Hetz Chaim Hi Lama Chazikim Ba Hetz Chaim Hi Lama Chazikim Ba Hetz Chaim Hi It's Chaim Hi, Lama Chazikim Ba. It's Chaim Hi, Lama Chazikim Ba. It's Chaim Hi, Lama Chazikim Ba. It's Chaim Hi. 